How, do you, is it just a it's just a YouTube integration? Is it? Yeah, it's built into the Zoom. Um, so okay. you've got to have the sort of pay for version of Zoom, and then you can. Um, there's basically a button for it. It's pretty trivial. Now I've got to go and make a few other people, including you, a co-host, so that you can actually present some slides. Assuming you'd like to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to be able to do that. That'd be great. All right, and I need to go and also join myself as a backup here. So the live stream should be up and running. Welcome to all uh, our viewers on the live stream. And uh, I'm just going to go and copy that link so that you can all find it. Copy that link into the various channels. Great, that's done. So now I've got to go and announce that on, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. I've noticed Zoom is playing silly buggers with my screen. Do you, do I, when I, when I go to the other screen and back again, my screen flashes, does, does it flash on Zoom? Oh no, it stopped now. There we go, does that flash? Do I look like I'm flashing? All right, I'm not noticing it, but uh, okay, I'm coming in via a slightly um, strange. Must be a local thing. G'day Randy, welcome. Hello, hello. Now, on to Facebook. Right. That's, I think I've got all of the key things that I've got a little checklist to sort of, so I don't forget key things in uh, when I'm starting each session. And that is my checklist done. So, Great. Okay, all good. We've got about 10 minutes to spare, so that's good. I'd suggest you spend those 10 minutes to read through that um, that controls chat, but it'll take more than 10 minutes to catch up, I think. Oh, the ADRC one, yeah. I glanced at it a little bit earlier, but... Uh... I, as yet, I haven't seen links to actual code for it. We can immediately try. But um, yeah, that's yeah, cool. I think it's exciting Chris stuff. That, Chris is in that chat now, and it seems as though he's prototyped it, so he might have a chance of getting something. Okay, great.
to Mick to think about whether we want to do a live stream next year um, when we have a face-to-face -face conference. And I'd be inclined to say probably yes. That's, uh, I think it's actually been quite successful. We need to make sure we have enough bandwidth at the hotel to be able to do it, though. Yeah, and obviously, you know, the production's a little more challenging trying yeah. to get set up, but um, I, I think we should, and I think it's achievable. Yeah, but it's tempting just to do it with, um, so with Zoom, but with some people live, um, as in we have an audience there, but then the yeah, presenter yeah. actually, you know, is on Zoom as well. Um, I think that it's, it really was quite painless this year. So delighted that that path tracking in the EQF worked so well. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to see how all that works when, um, uh, you know, on multiple flights and whether the, the tuning and things have done on is consistent between flights. Yeah, and I think obviously it'll tighten up um, quite a bit more once we get the, that jitter out of it because he hasn't implemented your jitter in that. Um... No, but he only had about 10 milliseconds. I was expecting a lot more. Um, I suspect actually the reason that the jitter was so low is actually because of Andy's changes to the UART code. Because my past experience with these types of systems was that the timing jitter on the UARTs was a lot higher than that. Maybe we need and, to go back and revisit that GPS jitter code then and see what numbers are there. Well, now. the jitter code is still, you know, I mean, less, if there's less jitter and, you know, the, the, the jitter removal algorithm will still do fine. Um, it just seems. I, he was. They were flying with an H7. It was a cube orange, and it was running master. Um, and that means it was running with the UART per thread, and also with the code, the um, the new sort of conjecture. Uh, you merged uh, something else to uh, uh, noticed uh, one of your older PRs. Sorry, uh, which fair, one? fair fair UART scheduling. I think it was titled. Yeah, that one, the, the, the name is a bit of a misnomer because the point of that PR was completely be replaced by Andy's rewrite of the UART driver. Um, there's only a few lines left that are relevant. So the title on the PR is completely uh, bogus now. But the one remaining piece of it that is actually worthwhile is that if you've got significant contention over an extended period on a UART and the UART is 115 kilobord or, or less, you might as well just turn off DMA and just use interrupt driven transmit. Um, and that means that, um, so. Does that reset all of the, uh, we keep track of contention um, on a per, uh, where, what is it, per UART basis? It's a separate variable. Basis? So Randy has contention tracking inside the shared DMA code, but this uses a separate contention tracker for the individual UART. So it's yep. not on a per DMA but screen you, basis. What I'm per saying is if you turn DMA off on something, then presumably the other guys are, are no longer contended. So do we actually clear that state in them? Well, the percentage would be dropped. Um, but uh, no, I mean, Andy's stuff reports basically like a, you can get a percentage for statistics for reporting via at SIS, or you can ask whether an individual request was contended. So, and that's what, it's the API that allows you to say, um, did I have to wait to get this DMA channel? That's what the UART driver is now taking advantage of with this PR. So the PR, Andy, in case you're curious, is 16550. Um, and it's a, a very simple one. And I wonder actually whether, um, uh, oh no, it isn't 16550. No, 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 completely wrong PR. That's a, that's a GPS one. Where am I? Maybe I've even merged it. Uh, let me have a look because it at my and, and just the question, Peter, about the stats. The stats are reset every time you do an FTP get on them. Right. Yes. Yes. So, so there is there for this sort of system reporting. Yes, I have merged the fair share, fair scheduling for UARTs. So that was three days ago that I merged it. Um, and so, but I, I set a threshold of 115 kiloboard, but for transmit, we can actually, uh, you, the threshold is actually more of a receive thing on DMA because you need, if you're going 230 kiloboard or above, then you risk losing bytes on receive with interrupt driven just because of the interrupt latency. But you don't lose bytes on transmit doing interrupt driven. You just increase your CPU load. 
And so if it really is high contention on transmit, I've, I might in the future change that threshold and include 230 kiloboard um, in that list, um, particularly on the faster CPUs, because we'd rather reduce the contention than reduce CPU. It's this balancing act with sort of CPU versus contention. Um, the, once we do the the full runtime allocation of DMA channels, then mm. a lot of this stuff will go away anyway. And yep. I really want to get onto that fairly soon. Um, I think that's going to be a, a big step up. Yeah, the, the code I'm thinking of, um, I'm not sure that's the stuff that you actually, uh, I think I was referring to possibly different stuff than, uh, you, that you were talking about there, the, um, <laughs> Something about if we're contended, then we reduce our send size or something like that. Oh, we've had that for our latency. Ages. So yep. all and um, so yes, it it does have this little contention counter, and it it reduces the send size. Um, that's right. But if the, if the counter is reset or whatever state, yeah, that reset, that's, that's a might... good point. Um, that might be worth revisiting with the new UI structure to see whether. Um, we should keep like a low pass filtered contention that that does degrade over time for when we will particularly need that when we reallocate um, DMA channels mm. when we start shifting them around because otherwise we could end up with small transmit size when we don't really need it yep. especially if we ended up with a dedicated channel. Of course, that might just distract from doing the proper thing, which is doing the runtime allocation. Well, they'll they'll, they'll need each other. You know, oh, if I see. Start the... doing runtime allocation. It's particularly important to you know if you do end up with owning the, the channel yourself and there's no one else wanting to use it, there's no point in reducing the send sizes. Yep. But just, I mean, our send sizes aren't very big anyway. We do use uh, two, I think it's two 64 byte buffers at the moment. We, and we flick between the two of them. Um, and uh, yeah, it's something along those lines. And that's yeah. the, they're the buffers. I think relatively we'll small. To, they're the it's buffers we need to refill. Two minute warning for Andy and um, Pete, you're live streaming yourself wandering around your office. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's entertaining the masses. Yeah, indeed. And watch me fumble with my hardware. That's fine. I mean, you know, the fact that I've cross-threaded this screw in it's uh, plastic. Eh. I'm glad it's other people that do that as well. It's so annoying. <laughs> and plastic is really bad because it ends up catching and, yeah. Yeah. Bit tearing my fingers up trying to work inside this plane too, and it shouldn't even be the hardest of planes to work on either. So, just replacing all the broken bits. Now, if we, if we got uh, Pete Hall here, is he logged in yet? Morning. Good I'm morning. Here. Just so about awake. I'll just make you a co-host so that, you know, if my internet goes down, then you guys can be self-sufficient. Uh, so that's done. Hopefully the internet works in Canberra. Yeah, and I've actually got a backup uh, internet connection at home to make it less likely it goes down. But, you know, these things happen. And the SOD's law means it'll happen in the middle of, you know, the conference talks and, and then I... Uh, if I'm the host and you guys don't have the privileges to grant, for example, Pete screen share, that would be really annoying. Yeah, well, uh, Fridge, I spent a couple of hours this afternoon trying to write an improved uh, limit cycle detector. Oh, it's goody. Tough, oh, well it's spent, a tough I hope. problem. I've tried it about is, two or I three imagine. different ways. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so... Uh, you know, counting events, the, the classic event thing, I'm very wary of going down that path because of noise on or other different frequency contents on the data. So just taking a derivative and getting the um, filtering the energy on that and then applying, I think just applying a little bit of filtering on the attack. You know, we have a decay filter. Okay, yep. Yep, well... We can also filter a little bit on the attack. So it's a bit like an audio compressor where you have an attack time constant and a, and a decay time constant. And maybe an attack time constant is going to stop it reacting. Because at the moment, what happens, you get a little noise spike yep. and, and you, or, or you get a, a mode change and you get a positive 
for example, when it when it belts into a turn, you'll get the aileron will will, will flick and then flick back, and mm -hmm. that's a positive and negative event, mm -hmm. and that's enough to immediately cause a gain compression. It's seven pm, mm -hmm. guys. All right. So, um, welcome to the fourth session of the IG Pilot uh, Developer Conference 2021. And we've had some fantastic talks this morning. And for those of you who are joining us um, in European time and weren't able to make the morning talks, if you have a look on the IGPilot.org YouTube channel, you'll find a playlist for the 2021 Developer Conference. And it includes all of the videos from this morning. So, you've got no excuses. Uh, there will be questions later on the latest in visual odometry. So um, this evening, uh, we are uh, delighted to have uh, Dr. Andy Piper talking to us uh, about uh, good vibrations. So we're expecting a wonderful music track with this, Andy. And uh, so over to you. I did think about that, but uh, the chances of the demo gods not smiling kindly were quite high, I think. All right, let me just share my screen. Okay, is that showing? Yeah, I assume that's showing. Good, uh, okay, so uh, good vibrations, yes. So here's the agenda for my talk. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about me, shameless self-promotion, why not? Um, uh, a little bit about control of copters, although I think Leonard and Paul will have to block their ears because I, I suspect I'll get a few things wrong. Um, and then talk about noise, removing noise, and the ways that we can do this with the harmonic notch. Um, and uh, hopefully there will be time for everything. So uh, this is me. So uh, yeah, I've got a PhD in distributed systems. So my background is very much software, not uh, hardware or physics. I, I did do a degree in engineering, but that was a long, long time ago. Um, so most of the work I've done is on Java server projects, um, both here in the UK and in the US for a while. Uh, and uh, I run the engineering function at an AI startup at the moment. Uh, and drones are my hobby, which you might not be able to tell. I don't, you probably can't see this, but this is, this is uh, um, source code contributions in the last two years, and I am actually the third highest in the last two years, which is a little bit sad, I have to say, given that I have a, a job and a family. A and slack a wife. of you. I mean, you know, you could you could you could get up to number one if you tried. <laughs> um, and actually, I don't know whether you can see that, but uh, my family uh, does that show up on the screen? No, Hold it in no. front of you, and it'll it'll appear. And yep. That. So that was that was a present from my family. So obviously they're quite frustrated with the amount of time I spend uh, uh, doing drones and coding. But uh, there we go. All right. So moving on. So good vibrations. Well, actually, it's it's a, a misnomer. There aren't really any good <laughs> vibrations. Uh, but I thought it made for a catchy title, as uh, as you always want with these talks. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, probably the music would be inappropriate uh, in, in that score. So, um, yeah, so, so Leonard and Paul, please block your ears at this point because I'm sure I'll get some stuff wrong. Uh, so, ha controller multicopters are based on PID loops. Uh, so, uh, we take, we measure some output, we compare it to the input we want, and we determine an error term. And then, uh, using that error, error term, we apply proportional integral and derivative. Uh, uh, components based on uh, some constant uh, that goes into the control and then we measure again and we go around this loop again and again and again. So measuring what we want with, sorry, what we want with what we have, determining an error and, and on we go. Uh, it's obviously a lot more complicated than that, but I think uh, as, a, as a sort of, uh, as a software engineer, this is complicated enough for me. Uh, and I'm sure you've sort of seen these sorts of graphs there. Um, uh, if, if you want a step change in your control, so you, know, you whack the throttle hard up or you uh, roll hard over, 
how you select these constant constants and the components that you apply affects the control and you can either sort of set them conservatively and you get a very slow response with a lot of latency or you can set them very aggressively and you get overshoots so that the, the, the copter will respond very rapidly but then go past what you want and so uh, if you can imagine on this one you know sort of the error term builds up and builds up and then the, the, the sort of constants kick in and builds up this way and so on. So you're sort of always trying to pick terms that give you the most, you know, something more like this, so rapid response uh, close to, to the, the, the reference that, that you're aiming for. But there's a problem with this, and the problem is noise. Uh, and uh, multi-copters have a lot of noise. <laughs> And uh, noise typically comes in at the measurement stage. So, you know, you go through this process uh, and you're happily measuring what's going on, but what you're measuring is not only, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, angles and rates of rotation of the copter, but you're also measuring some degree of noise. And this noise goes into this error term. And that's a problem. Uh, because it means that there is uncertainty in the thing that you're measuring. And it therefore means that the error that you're trying to calculate is wrong. So, it, you know, that the, 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 the control loops see a particular error, they correct for that error, but the error that they're seeing is not the real error. <laughs> it, it's uh, sort of error plus noise. And so we sort of get in this state where we're applying corrections that are not necessarily the things that, that, that you want. Now, um, wh where does this noise come from? So I, I think this is probably all sort of fairly obvious to people, but uh, I, I, I sort of like to characterize this as direct and indirect noise, not, not a te technical term, um, but just sort of the, the way I like to think about it. So obviously there's a lot of direct noise in, in, a, in a, uh, a, a copter. Um, prop balance is one, bearings, blade passage uh, uh, over, um, uh, over the frame and obviously the motors themselves. But apart from that direct noise, there's a lot of other noise that sort of creeps in. Uh, and uh, some of these things you see are, are usually to do with resonance or, or feedback of some kind. So in particular, you can amplify direct noise through the pit loop. So you can make things worse uh, by the sort of the, the, the control amplification that the pit loop might do. You can also see harmonics from the frame. So at particular frequencies, the frame might start vibrating. Uh, and you see similar, um, similar things inside uh, some of these sort of more fancy uh, flight controllers with the uh, um, damping foam inside. The foam tends to have a, a sort of harmonic frequency as well. So as, as well as the sort of noise being directly applied to the copter, there's a bunch of other stuff going on. And uh, all of this translates into poor control. So uh, the, you know, in, in the history of, of uh, RG pilots and RG copter, uh, the focus was very much on, on physical modification um, uh, in order to kill noise and uh, I, I guess partly that's because of the way the EKF works and you can't sort of do software filtering on the EKF and so you really want to do, try and do uh, physical uh, isolation of things. So in particular, you put foam on your, um, uh, uh, on your flight controller to insulate it from the, the physical uh, processes going on. Uh, you can use inertia. So I know that uh, Leonard is fond of kind of bolting his flight controllers to a big battery and the inertia of the, the mass of the battery prevents vibrations getting in. Um, and also frame material makes a very big difference as well. So, I, you know, one of, one of the things you typically see is people trying to fly with these very flexible Jeep frames, and that creates an awful lot of problems noise-wise. Um, I, I, most of the copters I fly with have very, very stiff carbon fiber frames, and that makes a big, big, big difference to, to the sort of uh, transmission of noise and the, and the resonances involved. So you can do physical things. Um, 
but uh, physical modification only gets you so far. And, and the other problem is size a little bit. So, um, uh, you know, I, I guess, so here's a, I should probably learn how to switch off my virtual background anyway. So if I can, can you see that? So that's, uh, uh, there we go. Need that's to either switch off. off the background or hold it in front of your chest, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think you can see that. Yeah. Um, so that's a two and a half inch. Uh, um, I think I will switch off the background. Hang on. Uh, Big reveal. Is... Yeah, where are settings <laughs> while I'm sharing? Under the video, under the little start video, stop video button. Ah, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Choose virtual background. None. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hey. So there, you can see that. So that's a two and a half inch sized copter, two and a half inch props. You can kind of see that the flight controller and everything else is absolutely packed in there. So the chances of doing sort of foam isolation are pretty low. I mean, there is some isolation on that, little rubber grommets, but it, it gets kind of hard with, uh, um, uh, with, with uh, uh, something that small. Um, and so, what you can do is you can use software and software can make a big, big, big difference. Uh, and in particular, because you know where a lot of this noise is, uh, which is at the motor, motor frequency, the RPM of the motors uh, and harmonics of that frequency. And we can target that with a notch filter. I'll come on to that in a little bit. And I would say we can remove almost all of the indirect noise and a lot of the kind of direct noise. So you can make a big, big, big difference. Uh, as far as control is concerned, it, you know, so uh, uh, other things still still see this noise, um, but uh, for control, we can remove a lot of this. Okay, so uh, the harmonic notch. So the harmonic notch is a is a slightly strange name. Uh, uh, kind of Leonard and I came up, up 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 with it a long time ago, and it sort of stuck. But it's not actually a single notch uh, at all. It's a set of notch filters. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they're running at the, uh, the, the gyro sample rate uh, and they are not a fixed. So we used to have a fixed notch in, in RG Pilot, but now the thing about the harmonic notch is that the center frequency of the notch varies over time. And that, that's sort of the key component. Uh, and so you can see a, a, a nice little bow pop that uh, um, uh, Leonard did here, apologies Leonard for plagiarizing your uh, stuff. Um, but in particular, you can see the sort of frequency response of uh, uh, notch filters for different attenuations here. Um, and I think the thing to note is that um, with high attenuation, the, the, the sort of frequency that is most killed is very, very narrow. I think that that's the thing you've got to notice here. So you can sort of cover a wide range of frequencies uh, with not much attenuation. But if you want a lot of attenuation, the, the frequency band that it targets is very, very narrow. Um, and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> there is a lot of noise, especially in these smaller copters. You know, the, 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 um, the, the motor noise gets really, really noisy. And so it's really important to accurately get that particular noise frequency. Um, now, and a lot of the sort of the smarts around the, the harmonic notch are about how you target that frequency. And we'll sort of get on to uh, different ways that you can do that uh, in a little bit. Um, but some things to note are that uh, each motor has a different frequency. So for instance, if you've got a copter that's somewhat imbalanced, you know, front to back, say you've got two motors going faster than the uh, front two going faster than the back two or vice versa, then you have more than one frequency that you're trying to get at. Um, and that can sort of prove problematic in terms of removing the, the noise. Uh, and, and then the way that we target the frequencies is through a number of different mechanisms. So in 4.0, there was throttle estimation, there was some ESC telemetry support, but there's more in 4.1. Uh, 
Uh, and then also now in 4.1, there is in-flight FFT uh, support for targeting the center frequency. And uh, hopefully I'll get a little bit of time to, to talk about the FFT in particular, because there's some sort of interesting stuff going on there. And uh, 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 yeah, it's good for people to understand. So one, one of the things that um, Leonard and I discovered over time is that the update rate is really important. Um, so this is the rate at which we change the center frequency of, of the notch. So what, what, what used to happen early on in the development was that uh, we changed the update rate, the, the center frequency relatively slowly at 50 Hertz. And then we applied the filter relatively fast at, at the gyro rate. So kilohertz or, or on most of my copters is two kilohertz. But uh, that, that creates some problems. Uh, and in particular, it's all around, well, there's a, there's a couple of problems. One is that um, uh, you know, if you're running at a low rate, you, there is therefore some latency between when you took the measurement and when you apply the filter. Uh, and if you're flying very fast or doing lots of different things, um, that means that uh, you can be sort of out of date quite quickly and the notch can be targeting the wrong frequencies. Uh, the other thing that goes on is this thing called shot noise. So uh, what can also happen is that, uh, again, potentially in dynamic flight where frequencies are changing, there can be large step changes in the frequencies that you're targeting. And those step changes can look like noise themselves, <laughs> which is kind of, kind of a bummer, really. Uh, so uh, um, one of the uh, and the big way that you can sort of uh, uh, mitigate against this is to update more rapidly. Uh, it costs some CPU, but the more update, uh, the more rapidly you update, the lower the latency and the closer uh, and the sort of less uh, um, violently the center frequency changes, reducing this shot noise. And then also we can do some slewing on, on the, the, the sort of uh, frequency changes to, to, to change uh, further. So we started at 50 Hertz. It's up to 200 Hertz now for the update rate. I'm sort of trying to sort of uh, get in a change that changes that to the loop rate. So sort of getting faster and faster, but there is some, uh, some CPU cost involved. Okay, so I, I sort of mentioned the different ways that we can do this, uh, and each of these has sort of pros and cons. Um, and uh, as you can, as you sort of hopefully gathered by now, uh, latency, latency is important, accuracy is important, update rate is important, CPU cost is important, uh, and often these things are a little bit of a trade off. So the sort of basic uh, uh, harmonic notch in 4.0 is throttle based. So we use a sort of throttle estimate uh, to control the center uh, frequency. And the great thing about that is there's no, effectively no latency. The update is immediate uh, or as fast as we want to read it. But it's pretty low accuracy. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a good estimate, but it's uh, not nearly as accurate as some of these other, uh, um, uh, other mechanisms and, and so in, particularly in dynamic flight, it can be quite, uh, quite problematic. Uh, you can update at the loop rate, no problem. Um, so, uh, you know, because we can just sort of get this estimate all of the time. And it's very, very low cost CPU wise. Uh, just, you know, it's a very simple calculation, just using uh, uh, throttle out as a proxy for uh, motor R RPM. So then also in, in uh, in 4.0, there's ESC based telemetry. So basically, this is just BL Heli uh, uh, at, at the moment. Um, and uh, this too is pretty low latency. So you can request uh, RPM updates from, um, uh, from the ESCs. Uh, they'll tell you uh, we, there's some latency in the sense that we rotate around between ESCs. Uh, but it is fairly accurate because the ESCs know exactly how fast the motors are going. Um, and it is also fairly low CPU. The, the downside is that you can only get up to about 100 hertz, uh, just based on the amount of data that you can pump through 
uh, the UART that you have to use and the fact that you're kind of rotating around uh, the SCs. Um, so that, that's pretty good and, and, and sort of, you know, certainly for 4.0, if you can use ESC telemetry, that would be my, my sort of go-to uh, uh, go mechanism. And then in 4.1, we've sort of extended ESC telemetry to include bidirectional D-shot. And that, so this is where instead of using a separate UART, we use um, the uh, PWM output in a sort of half duplex mode and uh, can read data from the ESC on the same line as we're pushing out PDO or D shot signals. Um, and uh, one of the nice things about bidirectional D shot is you can go really, really fast. So uh, we can um, sort of up the rate at which we're outputting, and that also ups the, ups the rate at which we're reading. Um, we still rotate between ESCs, but on a per timer basis. So on some flight controllers, that might be you know, a single, single timer for all four motors or more. So you'd sort of divide by four to get your update rate. On some copters, the, the, it just sort of works out. It depends on how the, the PDRM groups are organized, but uh, certainly on my uh, um, smaller copters, there are two timers involved. And so I get fairly high update rates because it's, it's basically half uh, of the D-shot output rate. It is a bit more expensive CPU-wise, um, and obviously the faster you go, the more expensive it gets, but uh, um, this seems to work pretty well. And then uh, FFT is kind of the, 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 the other new one for point one. So uh, FFT can be very, very highly accurate because you're measuring actual noise rather than a proxy for noise. Um, but uh, the more accurate it gets, the higher the latency, the longer it takes to, to get data out. So you can either sort of go for high accuracy, low update rate, or medium accuracy and high update rate. Um, and uh, it also is fairly costly from a, uh, a CPU perspective. All right, so <laughs> I'm going to now switch to some live demos, I hope. There are some uh, questions on that first, just on yeah, the... Yeah, of um, course. Yeah, go ahead. Ask some questions. Sorry, Andy. Um, if, interpolating, if, if we had a low rate one like FFT, uh, do we use the throttle uh, with like a complementary filter between the low frequency update but high accuracy FFT versus and use the throttle to interpolate so you can you can basically boost its rate we we don't currently that's something leonard would like to do uh, so it's certainly a, a possible possibility so you could use you could use the fft to basically sort of checkpoint the throttle update to to, to make it more accurate so that would well, be a way there'll also be a, a bit of lag so i wonder whether um actually doing like a complementary filter between the two um and um, I've just created a, a, a generic complementary filter class uh, for IDU pilot. So I've got a new hammer and I'm looking for nails to go and oh, whack okay. it on, you see. <laughs> um, and uh, so I wondered if that might actually be appropriate. Uh, anyone else want to comment on that, whether that makes sense? I mean, in, in a sense it does because throttle leads the change in RPM. Mm -hmm. So yes, you could have a... But the question, what you would need to know then is the derivative from throttle to RPM change mm -hmm. yeah. to, to get that to work. So, but that could be estimated from the, the data. I but mean, even if you knew it approximately, I mean, just a, just yeah. a few points of data and getting it very approximately would certainly, right. should make it more responsive um, than the current one, which is going to be really laggy. Yeah, so I might show you my new hammer later, Andy, um, okay. yes. and uh, we'll see if we can we can find a nail to whack it on. Sounds good. All right, so let me get back to my finger chopping. Okay, is that? Can you see that now? Sharing my screen. Yep. No troubles. Yep. Okay. Cool. So, uh, okay, so, uh, uh, I, so I've got a, this is my sort of go-to copter. This is the one, a um, little bit of history here. So this is the one that got uh, 
driven over <laughs> by several cars. Uh, and um, the only bit of the frame that survived was the top plate. Uh, but also, interestingly, the ESCs survived as well. I, you know, I don't know why those are so uh, um, uh, uh, robust, but they are so. And you know, kudos to our Matten for, <laughs> for basically replacing the frame, even though you know you would think that being driven over by a car was not covered by the warranty. Um, this is also for Randy. This is the one that doesn't have a copter or a GPS. So this is the one that sort of sometimes your drifts. Uh, huh? Of that copter. <laughs> That's right, that copter. But this, this is, is you know, the one I, that can only turn left, right, Andy. <laughs> yeah, this only one, this only turns left as well. You're right. Um, but uh, the great thing is that uh, if I crash this, it, I don't care that much, and so it's been rebuilt several times. So uh, um, it's uh, it's an uh, it's very stiff carbon fiber frame. So it's I think it's three mil. Um, and there's a Kakuta F7 Mini sort of tucked in there, and it's uh, a four-in-one ESCs. So let me wait. Uh, <coughs> fancy here. So. Ooh, fancy video setup. So I did think about doing this with, um, you know, ha having a sort of fake accident and then using tomato ketchup on my fingers just to sort of generate some uh, uh, drama. But I, I figured that the chances of that actually going wrong were a bit too high. So <laughs> I didn't, didn't go for that one. Um, okay, so the setup here is that this is, this is tuned. So this is, there's, uh, this has been highly tuned, um, but I've switched all of the notches off or, or on this copter. So it's basically um, uh, regular tuning, uh, without sort of any sort of further software filtering. Um, so I'm just going to do a little hover. Download uh, the logs. Okay, so uh, so I've got this log three here, and what I'm going to do I'm putting this so it stops making noises. So uh, I'm going to uh, run um, this MAVFFT ISB tool, which is in PyMavLink uh, on the log. Um, and uh, first of all, I'll sort of show it the way it might appear in Mission Planet. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Is that the right log? Oh yeah, I think it is. So, so the thing to notice is the scale on the side here. So that this is, although it's, um, although it uh, uh, looks like a tiny, uh, tiny blip because of all the sort of control, uh, control frequencies here, this is actually quite high. Um, but you can kind of see it's, it's hard to see on a, on a linear scale and so, um, if I switch this to uh, log scale, we can see a little bit more um, in terms of what's going on. Uh, okay, so, uh, and what you can, oh, uh, sorry about the flashing, I think that's zoom. So what you can see here is an awful lot of noise around the motor uh, frequency. So they, this copter hovers at like two, yeah, two, 10 to 20, something like that. And this is, a, this is a log scale. So you can see that this peak here is really quite high on a, on a log scale. Um, we sort of want it down here uh, somewhere. Um, and uh, I mean, 
you can also on this you can see the 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 harmonics quite easily here so here's another harmonic here getting a bit lower um, and there's even another harmonic somewhere around here getting lower still uh, but the most the noise is on the the this sort of primary um, primary harmonic and this is usually true for smaller copters interestingly on bigger copters sometimes these two switch so you can actually get more energy on the second harmonic than the first harmonic um, which can cause some problems and I'll sort of get into that a, a little bit later. Uh, and then if I, uh, so I had to teach myself how to use MavGraph for this, because uh, <laughs> I usually use Mission Planner. Um, so let me, uh, let's just do this. Okay, and so, so I think the thing, thing to note here is, okay, so here's the throttle, here's the hover that we did. Um, just that this, this roll, this roll output here, th there's quite a lot of variation here, and this kind of relates to, to the amount of uh, 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 noise that, that's sort of coming through. So, uh, okay, so what I'm gonna do next is, back to my proxy. So I'm going to enable the harmonic notch. And here you can sort of see the uh, um, uh, the settings are selected, and actually, I'm going to set the um, the mode to three. So that means ESC telemetry. Uh, so I think that the, the thing to note is um, uh, a couple of things to note here. So one is, and sort of I've said this on the forums before, but this relationship between the frequency and the bandwidth is really important. This gives the shape of the notch filter. And so um, sometimes what you see is people changing the frequency without changing the bandwidth. And you can end up with very, very narrow or very, very wide notches. And that's probably not what you intended. Uh, so typically you want the bandwidth to be half of the, 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 the frequency. Um, the other thing to notice is that for ESC updates, I don't actually care that much what these values are, as long as they're sort of the proportions are correct, because the, the ESCs will set the actual frequency um, that, that I want. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, oh, and I'm gonna change. So we were looking at, the FFT information was pre-filter. Uh, FFT information. So I actually want to see um, post filter information, which means setting this to. to it might be just worth uh, pointing out there that the harmonic notch, um, the the ratio of the bandwidth to the to the center frequency defines um, the Q of the filter. So as, as Andy's um, changing the uh, center frequency up and down, that ratio stays the same. So it doesn't, it's not fixed at 40 Hertz. Um, it, it scales and, uh, um, and, and stretches it up and down with frequency. Yeah. Is that a half power, like a 3 dB? Um roll off diff what's the definition of width on the notch uh, uh it's the three db points on the notch i generally set it to about two thirds myself um uh, but it's um I, it's based on the uh on on a stand the standard um notch um equation like a standard notch second order not like uh what do you call them bike <laughs> It's a bi-quad, two-pole two like bi-quad yeah. filter, okay. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing to say is that this is scaled for the harmonics as well. So, for instance, if this was applying actually at 80 hertz 
Uh, and you see we've got harmonics of three, which means I've got two harmonics there, because this is sort of a bit mask. So it means that there would also be another notch at 160 hertz with a width of 80. So the, the Q factor is maintained for the harmonics as well. Okay, so uh, give us another little uh, spin. So back to Mav Proxy, oops. So uh, we'll look at the FFT again this time. Um, and uh, I suppose a couple of things to note is one you can see so on the log scale here so you can see that the um, the frequencies have gone down quite substantially uh, and the other thing is you can see the notch in the middle here so you can see this noise peak has been sort of attenuated uh, uh, in the middle because we've sort of stayed roughly around the, the, the whole frequency um, and uh, also you can see, because this is post filter, you can see that the harmonics are a lot lower as well. So this is partly the notch, but this is also due to the, the, the low pass filter that we use. Um, so on this copter, my low pass filter is set, close your ears, Leonard, at 130 Hertz. Uh, so it's sort of coming in around here somewhere. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and actually if we sort of look on the linear scale, Oops. You can see that uh, it sort of makes it a lot clearer. You can see <laughs> this uh, little blip here and, and uh, you know, sort of we're down, the, the scale is, is, is way down. Um, the, the other thing I think is always interesting to note, and I, I'm, apologies for those, I've said this many times before, but uh, one of the things about the notch filter is that um, uh, although we're targeting gyro noise, the excels get affected as well. And this is because we're sort of removing this indirect noise. We're stopping this sort of feedback loop. Uh, and so you can sort of see the effect of the notch filter in the excels, even though there's no filtering going on uh, in the excels, which I think is pretty cool. But there's still quite a lot of noise here, okay? So there's still noise either side, and you can see this effect of the notch being quite deep, but not, not sort of broad enough. Um, so uh, one of the things we can do is, instead of targeting one frequency here and then a harmonic here, we can instead uh, target a notch per motor. Uh, and um, the... Uh, the way you do this is, oops. Uh, so there's this H notch opt and um, uh, bit two is, is uh, notch per motor or notch per, per frequency because uh, the FFT does something slightly similar, uh, uh, something slightly different. Um, and uh, when I do this, I'm also going to just, um, just in the interest of time, uh, enable the FFT subsystem for um, 
for this next uh, piece. Um, okay, so let me do that one. <clears throat> And it's nice it arms so quickly now. <laughs> Otherwise, this would be a very long talk. this I had mixed man set to four and the thing hit the floor and then bounced two meters in the air which wasn't very uh, wasn't very safe but uh, fortunately we're past that now all right Uh, so uh, let me show um, this first. Okay. So this is log four. You just downloaded log five? Yeah, I did, didn't I? Sorry. You'll need you'll need to put quotes around those. Ah, oh, my my cut and paste went wrong. That's the problem, I think. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, uh, so here's sort of an interesting piece. So, um, first of all, you can see that. So, this is actually looking at the motor RPM. So, you can see that there's quite a a reasonably big difference between, I think this is front and back on this copter, so it's not, not the center of gravity is not strictly level. Um, and you can see that uh, the sort of one filter is targeted at, you know, roughly corresponds to one, one of these uh, RPMs. Um, now, uh, and I could show that for the other ones as well, but probably in the time I won't move on. Um, and if I show the noise, so this is beginning to get a bit better. So you can see, although there's kind of this, a little bit of a spike here, because this is a log scale, you can see that sort of overall, the, the, the noise is getting better and you can see it's fairly pronounced on the excels as, as well, sort of getting a cleaner and cleaner uh, 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 form. Now, it's not perfect. And one of the reasons it's not perfect is that um, on this copter, I don't know whether you can see, but I've got uh, one of the props is, uh, wait, wait, uh, can't really see that, but. It's, it's a pretty beat up prop with bits kind of missing on it. And, and that's uh, affecting a lot of the noise that uh, um, is actually coming through. And, and uh, these, obviously these techniques work where there's a good correspondence between the motor uh, and uh, what's going on, but uh, other physical characteristics can throw things out of whack. So uh, um, sort of note to self to use good props. Um, Okay, so I, I think, let me just quit that. So, so we've, so I haven't really covered the, the throttle notch. So um, uh, one of the things just sort of about this, uh, um, that the MAVF uh, ISB thing is that you can say minus minus notch params uh, and it will spit out. No, it won't. Uh, 
Okay, I will I'll ignore that. <laughs> it does have a feature of notch params that will actually spit out uh, the parameters, but for some reason on my log, it's failing to find that. Um, so my, uh, my Python foo is, is not great there. So we talked about frequency, we talked about bandwidth, the ATT is the attenuation uh, of the notch. And so um, the, the higher you set this, the sort of deeper and narrower the notch becomes. Uh, and then um, uh, the ref is the way that the, uh, um, uh, the notch, uh, the, the throttle output relates to the frequency. And we use sort of ref to do that, that scaling. Uh, and then for ESC telemetry, I've sort of talked about a notch per motor. Um, there is actually, uh, which you can use INSH notch ops for. There is bit one, which actually applies a double notch. Uh, and in the interest of time, I won't do that. But suffice to say, if I do do that, um, it actually makes the output worse. Uh, and so uh, on this particular copter. So uh, what a double notch does is it tries to sort of separate the center, applies two notches around the same center frequency to get a broader spread of frequency coverage. Uh, uh, and for bigger copters, that's quite good because you, you've got sort of a lot of noise going on. Um, for smaller copters with these very, very sharp peaks, that actually doesn't help much. And what, what ends up happening is you kind of end up missing the most dominant part of the noise in the middle of these two, two, two notches. And so although there's this double notch option, it actually makes, for small copters, it makes things worse. For big copters, it, it's actually a, a, a quite a good thing. Um, and then, I, I mean, these are all sort of in the docs, but, uh, uh, that in order to get ESC telemetry, you have to have your BL heavy uh, um, set up configured correctly. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of move on to the FFT uh, notch now. So um, if you remember, I enabled the FFT in that previous uh, um, uh, Yeah, where's the one I'm finding? Yeah. I enabled the FFT in uh, that previous log. So um, just, just a little bit of sort of information on how this works before I sort of show some, some graphs. So um, the FFT is performed on a sliding window, window of samples. And in fact, let me just kind of jump onto the picture because it's probably easier to see this way. So if you can imagine there's a bunch of samples coming in uh, um, at Majaro rate. Uh, and what we do is we select a window of those samples and run the FFT on that window. And we get a frequency output. And then we jump by a, a set, a, a number of samples and do it again. And so this is the way the in-flight FFT works basically. So we have a, it's not as, we're not sliding per sample, we're sliding per set of samples. Um, partly because it's just too expensive to slide per, per sample and also you just can't keep up because the, these samples are coming in very, very rapidly and you want to make sure that you're always dealing with the latest data. So um, uh, the in-flight FFT is running these windows on an ongoing basis across uh, um, samples of gyro uh, uh, samples. Now, I think one of the things to, to note about the way FFTs work, so um, FFTs take time domain data, translate it into frequency domain data. Uh, and, and the sort of key characteristics of FFT are the sample rate, the number of samples that you're using to run your FFT, uh, and effectively the resolution. And so um, the, the way this works is that uh, the resolution, so the resolution is the, the width of the frequency coverage for a particular value of the FFT. So for, in, and this is determined by the sample rate, rate divided by the number of samples. So if you can imagine, to make the maths easy, let's say I'm taking 10, um, 10 samples in a window and my sample rate is 100 hertz. That means that 100 divided by 10 gives me 10 hertz. So each of my, so the maximum resolution that I can get for my FFT is 10 hertz. So I'll, I'll get a value and I don't know whether 
you know, I, I get a value for a bin and I don't know uh, whether the frequency is um, uh, 11 hertz or 19 hertz, say. So the, the frequency could be uh, um, uh, within that, that sort of range. Uh, and uh, so the mathematicians uh, amongst you will notice that, uh, well, what you can do is that you can increase n. So the higher you make n, uh, the uh, narrower the bin, bins become, and that's true. So, you know, we can make n quite large. We can inf even, even make n the same size as the sample rate and get a one hertz resolution. Um, now, there's a couple of problems with that. So one is that uh, as we, we want quite high sample rates to get good fatality. So I'm sort of running with a sample rate of two kilohertz. Uh, and so to get one hertz fidelity, you'd need to run a sample of, uh, you need to run an FFT on a length of 2000, which is quite computationally expensive. But the other problem is that you get this latency. And so the, the, let, let's say I've got a, we look at this window here. So <clears throat> the first sample for this window is here. And the point at which I get the FFT outcome is here. And so you get this latency that is the opposite of this. So it's n divided by the sample rate. And so you've got this, this sort of Schrodinger's cat type uh, uh, um, relationship where if you have very high frequency resolution, you have very poor time resolution. And vice versa, if you have very high time resolution, you have very poor frequency resolution. And so a lot of, a lot of the trick with, um, with FFTs is picking good values for these so that you get decent time resolution and decent frequency resolution. Uh, okay, so I've kind of said, uh, said this report, sliding window of samples, um, we need to sort of jump fast enough to keep up with uh, the gyro rates. Um, and it needs to be big enough, the window to be accurate and small enough to be fast. And if you run with FFTs enabled, you'll see a little startup message uh, that looks like this. And this is the sample rate. So uh, for this particular one, my sample rate is two kilohertz, is, which is what I'm running my uh, gyros at. The next number is the bin size. So on this FFT, I'm getting uh, <coughs> a resolution of, of about eight hertz. And then the final number is the update rate. So this is the, this is the rate at which we're updating, uh, we're able to produce new frequency outputs. And uh, one of the things about um, <clears throat> this bin size is there are some tricks that you can do to uh, uh, improve the, the resolution. Uh, and uh, the tricks get quite complicated. And so there's uh, a few things. So first of all, <clears throat> we don't want to just take an FFT on a kind of a, 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 a rectangular window of samples because what happens is that you that the um, the difference between if we go back to our window here, so the difference between this sample here, some IMU data, and nothing looks like a frequency jump. And so you've got this sort of problem with FFTs that, that the edges can create artificial noise. And so uh, what you need to do is you have to put the samples through a window. I use a Hanning window, which kind of biases the FFT to the, the sort of center set of samples so that you avoid these, these sort of spurious spectral leakages things. <clears throat> And then also there's a whole sort of field of estimation around how you can get better res resolution for the free frequency other than just the bin size. And this, this, this is possible because FTs are calculated in the, the complex domain and you have both real and complex components of the frequency information and you can use that information to get a better, better uh, estimation. And so I, I use this thing called Quinn's second estimator to do interpolation. All right, so uh, in terms of using the FFT, um, really the only setup is that you need is these three options. So you need to enable the FFT, which uh, as you saw, I did on that log. 
you need to specify the minimum hertz that you're interested in, the maximum hertz that you're interested in, and that's pretty much it. And if we look at this graph, uh, yeah, okay. So what you can see here is, so we, my apologies for the flashing, this is zoom, no, okay. Um, so uh, what, what you can see is, so these three, so I'm, if you remember, I'm still based on the ESC telemetry notch. So these three notches, and this is, DNF is the dynamic notch frequency. So I've got three, three notches here, the fourth one's not shown, are tracking the ESC telemetry. And what you can see is that the, um, this, which is the, the, this is the red line here, which is the FFT response. <coughs> uh, this is the FFT average response, tracks this, um, this uh, particular frequency very, very accurately. So you can see that uh, um, the FFT is pretty accurate uh, in, in these circumstances. Um, and you can see also it's, it's sort of fairly smooth uh, uh, as well. Uh, okay. So, and I th think in the interest of time, I'm not going to do any more demos. Let's see whether this log gives us uh, enough. Well, I'll do. I'll do one more. So, okay. So, uh, that's You can see I've got my FFT uh, um, enabled, and uh, uh, it, it's uh, I, I've got my minimum hertz and maximum hertz. So I basically want to take FFTs between 80 hertz and 650 hertz. So this copter at full tilt, will, the motors will go at about 600 hertz, which is why this is set quite high. Um, uh, and you see, I can see you can see that the size of the FFT is 128. Um, the, the default that we ship with is 32, so fairly low CPU. So I'm using a fairly long FFT here to get better accuracy. And you can see I've got 75% overlap. So I'm basically, every time I get another quarter of a window of samples, I'll run the FFT uh, again. And uh, what I'm gonna do is set the notch. Um, to FFT, so this is at H notch mode four. And let's see the other ones. Could you, am I okay to go a few minutes over, or do I need to hard stop in two minutes? Absolutely fine to go over. It's a very loose schedule on this conference. Okay, good. Good. I wouldn't want you to miss on the fun. <laughs> no worries. Uh, uh, okay, so um, so what, just thing to note here is so, uh, and we'll see what happens here because this this was quite interesting when I sort of practiced this. So, uh, so I'm tracking the FFT. This is H notch mode four, um, and I've still got H notch op set to two. So this is a notch per frequency now. But because I'm um, uh, tracking, because I'm using FFT now this is going to track multiple frequencies using the FFT rather than multiple motors. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, when I get the log, we'll have a look at what that, that means. So, uh, okay. Let's flip over that. The reason, the reason that prop is so beat up is because it's really close to the battery lead and so it keeps clipping the battery lead when things go wrong. So. <coughs> so let's just see what happens here.
So I don't know where you saw that, but there was kind of a little, little bit of twitching at the end there, which is what happened before. And I'll explain why that happens in just a minute. So. Right, so let's get this log. Okay, so just uh, just to prove that it works, I'll just run the. Uh, the FFT tool on it uh, and. Uh, zoom. So you can see that again we're sort of tracking fairly closely the noise is decently down, uh, you can see the same in the excels. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, and you can see that the tool recognizes that we're using FFT uh, tracking here. So the FFT notch works, which is great news. <laughs> uh, and actually works pretty well. I mean, the nice thing about it is that it's tracking actual noise rather than sort of interpolating noise from the most frequencies. Uh, so uh, that gives sort of quite nice accuracy, but uh, obviously the latency can be uh, a lot of a problem. So uh, what I'm going to do is going to switch to Mission Planner just so I can sort of explore uh, the graph a little bit more. I know I should use Merv Explorer. Sorry, I just wasn't quite familiar enough with that. So uh, I'll forgive you. <laughs> I'm actually just looking at why Merv Proxy wasn't able to auto reconnect on Windows. I think that'd be nice to fix. Um, yes, that's quite an old bug. I, 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 and this is Windows subsystem for Linux as well, which... Uh, yeah, I was going to give that a go, see if I can work out why that is. Okay. Right, so here we go. So hopefully that should be seen. And see that there's a little uh, um, hover. Uh, get rid of these. Okay, so uh, all of the, the log information for FFT is in these two, um, uh, two uh, log messages, F FTN1 and FTN2, and uh, um, peak average gives you a, 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 um, a, an average of what's being applied. I think one of the interesting things about uh, uh, FFTs is, oh gosh, sorry. If I blink too much, Zoom starts flashing my screen. Um, so one of the interesting things here is you can see these sort of big frequency jumps outside of um, uh, uh, the, the bit that we're hovering in. And uh, this, one of the reasons uh, for this is you have to be really careful about the energy that you're measuring in the FFT. Uh, and so we can actually have a look at, if I get rid of that, and have a look at the first um, first frequency. So you can see that we've got a nice clean FFT here for while we're hovering, but then all of this random junk outside. If we look at the energy, uh, and sort of the energy is measured as part of the FFT process, you can see that all of the energy is in this uh, um, uh, the bit where we're actually hovering. And so although basically the FFT is running on random noise at this point, and this is why you get these big frequency jumps. And so part of the algorithm is to discard stuff where the energy isn't high enough uh, to be a, a sort of valid FFT. Um, and there is actually a, uh, a, a parameter that you can set, the, the, the sort of SNR value, uh, which um, you can use to, to determine where that threshold lies. And it, it's different for, for different copters. So that's this sort of FFT SNR ref uh, value here. So this is the first peak that we detected. It's nice and clean. 
Um, if we have a look at uh, the second peak, uh, okay, so uh, yeah, my scale's gone bad, so let me have a look at this side. Um, so what, what you can see here is uh, we're getting some, we're getting some junky noise in, um, uh, in, in this sort of second detected FFP T peak. And uh, the, I think it's, I think actually what, what's happening is there is actually a bunch of data down here, but it's sort of being dominated by these sort of very high speed peaks. So we actually look at the dynamic notch for this second. So the dynamic notch for the first peak, nice and clean. You see this yellow one here. Dynamic notch for the second peak all over the place. Really, really horrible. And if you remember, I said shock noise is a really bad thing. And so what I think is going on here is you saw the twitches in the copter. I think that is shock noise from the second FFT creeping into the control loops. And so often with these small copters, you really only want the first FFT. You're actually running a, a, a notch per detected uh, Detected FFT frequency is just not a, a good idea. On bigger copters, it's really important because you've got all of these weird harmonics all over the place uh, and you want to sort of track these things. But on smaller copters, you get this very, very well-defined single, single frequency, you just want to track that, that thing. And then I think if, you, if we look at, so these are, I can't, these are organized by energy. So, so this will be the sort of biggest energy peak if we go down to the lowest energy peak, um, there's practically nothing there. It's not really detecting anything. All right, so in the home straight now. So we sort of talked about H notch ops. We've talked about the window overlap. We've talked about the window size. Um, so there are some advanced tuning options. So you can uh, determine the, the signal to noise sort of that you want to say the frequency is detected or not. Um, and then there's some other kind of weird, uh, weird, slightly bodgy options. And so this is, the reason these exist is for the way that, that we run the algorithm. So, um, so there's kind of a lot going on here. So we take filters, uh, a window of, uh, sorry, we take samples, a window of samples, and we run it through the Hanning window to avoid the spectral leakage. And then we run an FFT on those samples. And then we calculate the complex magnitude of the FFT data that we get back. And then we have to look for peaks. So that just basically gives us a, a, a bunch of frequency information, but we don't know where the actual peaks are. So we have to run a, uh, a detector or, or on that data to find the peaks. And this used to be a simple, what is the highest? And that actually proved to not work very well on bigger copters. So what you really want is to, to, to find things that are not spurious, but are actual sort of uh, uh, um, peaks in frequency. And so there's a little of algorithm that does that. And then we calculate the center frequency of each of those peaks using this Quinn second estimator. And then we retain the three highest energy peaks. So energy is important in the order of frequency. Now, one of the problems with this is that uh, the, the Energy varies a lot. So in, in there, you can see my Y6B in the background here. The, the energy that of the FFTs that we run flips and flops all over the place. And so what, what you can end up, what ends up happening a lot is that the highest energy frequency that you detected one run and that you've got a lower energy frequency here, they can flip over. So you can sort of have this, this flip-flopping effect where um, the FFT, the, the, the frequencies that you're detecting in energy terms are shifting all over the place. And that wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for shot noise, but shot noise is a problem. And so if we actually start changing the harmonic notch based on these flip-flopping uh, frequency peaks, we're just injecting noise into the system. And so it's quite important that we try and maintain some semblance of tracking the same frequencies over time. And so, uh, that there's a whole bunch of code that, that tries to do that, to reorder the peaks, to track some historical average so that we're not create, injecting all of this shot noise into the system. Um, we also don't want to use data that is uh, um, 
uh, below a certain energy threshold because that's just spurious. Uh, and then also with FFTs, you also get glitches all the time. So we run through a median uh, uh, filter and a low pass filter to sort of avoid the glitching. A bit, a bit similar to some of the glitching I think we've seen on the, 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 um, the, the uh, rangefinder stuff. And then, uh, uh, this, so this is one of the bodges. So one of the bodges is that, if you remember, this is a harmonic, it's a set of harmonic notches where you're not, if you're not matching. Um, so in the case of this smaller copter, we don't really want to match all of the frequency because you just want to pick the main one and then we want to run harmonics of that main frequency. Uh, now, sounds simple, but what happens when the energies are bouncing around all over the place? You can end up tracking not the primary harmonic, but the secondary or the tertiary. And so what you really want to try and do is always track the, the essentially the lowest frequency, um, even though it may not be the lowest energy. And so, uh, and then determine that that uh, um, that is actually harmonic and then run the sort of notch filters up, up from there. And so this is what this uh, um, harmonic uh, fit is so it basically says if I see a frequency that is sort of within some threshold of double double of another one I will assume that that's a harmonic and I'll pick the lower frequency and then similarly with harmonic peak uh, we can um, say well actually I'm more interested in the roll axis than the pitch axis we can actually see this on the graph here so if I go back to here uh, and just look at uh, X and Y and Z, you can see that Y is pretty noisy relative to X here. So this is the blue. If I go back to X, see X is much less noisy. And this is fairly typical. You'll often get more noise on one or more sort of spurious noise on one uh, axis than another. Uh, and certainly in my experimentation, the Z axis is, is usually useless. It's, it's usually roll and pitch that you want to, to track on. Um, but on bigger copters, you can get you can get one axis that is much much cleaner than the other axis, and so this is what this harmonic peak allows you to do. It allows you to select a particular axis and say that's the one I'm going to track. I don't care about the others. Okay, so that's how it all works, um, and uh, just one other thing to say is that. Uh, we sort of talked about the throttle notch and uh, how that works. Well, the um, uh, let's close that. The the FFT when it's running in the background will also make a determination of what the average frequency is and what the average bandwidth is, and what the throttle reference you need for the throttle uh, uh, um, uh, uh, for the throttle based notches. So it's perfectly possible without using the FFT to drive the notch to use the FFT to learn these values and in a similar way that we do uh, uh, hover learning. So if I show the uh, FFT uh, values here, you'll see that it's sort of learned. So this is a learned <coughs> value FFT frequency hover of 224 hertz and that corresponds pretty well with the peak that we saw in, in, in the, the, the sort of uh, FFT plots. And similarly, the bandwidth is not far off half. And so that's that's a learned value of bandwidth. <clears throat> and then the key part is the throttle reference. So this is a learned value for the throttle reference that you need to, if you wanted to set up, up the throttle notch, uh, to uh, um, do that. Now, the <clears throat> The interesting thing about this is, so you, you kind of, Leonard's probably looking at this value and thinking, why is that so low? So the reason it's so low is that this throttle ref value is scaled based on the min and max hertz. So basically this says, <clears throat> if I want my notch to, to track frequencies between 80 hertz and 650 hertz, what is the ref that I need? And this is the ref that you need. So if I was to set the min hertz to 200 hertz, say, so which is much closer to the hover frequency, this ref value would, uh, would, would go up. And so this is quite a nice way without sort of uh, 
um, <clears throat> having to sort of resort to sort of plotting graphs and all the rest of it to learn the values that you need to use the, the, the throttle notch. And that is it. Ask me anything. So once it's learned those, does that mean basically you then just run off the throttle and you don't need to anymore? You, you yeah. could continuously leave the FFT to update that data, but the the it will get the instantaneous update from the throttle. Is that right? Yeah. So so these these. Uh, do you need to manually copy those across? Yeah, you or? need to manually copy these. You need to manually copy these into the INSH notch uh, slots. So why don't we transfer those automatically? We could do. That's a nice future enhancement. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the only reason why you don't want to do it automatically is this ref needs to be one if you're using ASC telemetry. So, but I guess we could manage that based on the mode that's set. Well, you'd have to have a, a new like mode for it that says, you know, I want to copy from, yes. from FFT and it would then copy it across. Yes. Um, and that would pretty much automate it. That, and, and then we don't need the complementary filter and things, I presume. If, would you then continuously still run the FFT to update those all the time? You wouldn't need to. Um, if, if all you're interested in is the throttle notch. You, yeah, but the um, characteristics might change a little bit, uh, different battery yeah, weight or whatever. And, and, and obviously the, the way you might want to do this is the way you might want to do this for hover learning. So you basically want to do a fairly long hover so it gets fairly stable values for these. Um, and, and then you can transfer them and away you go. And Paul, yes, it's a Y6B on the cabinet. Um, Andy, I wonder, I wonder if I could ask you, because um, I know that you've got two firmware builds for the uh, bi-directional D-Shot. Um, yeah. what, what do we lose by going for the bi-directional D-Shot? Um, why have we had to go to two firmwares? Yeah, so, so the, um, the reason is that we, for bi-directional D-Shot, we can't use complementary outputs, which some flight controllers are set up for automatically. Uh, and the non-complementary outputs, the timer that they use is often used by something else in the firmware. And so, uh, for instance, the buzzer. So on some of these uh, uh, firmwares, the timer that's used to generate nice tones is the one that you need for non-complementary outputs in order to use bidirectional D-Shop. So it's that sort of thing that, that you lose. The other thing you lose is at the moment, because the timing characteristics are quite critical, uh, we dedicate a DMA channel to um, both the UP and CH uh, um, channels. And so you sort of lose some DMA channels that could otherwise be shared with other things. Okay. Does that, okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah, thank you. Ask another question, if I may. Um, uh, so, um, this is gonna. This is like um, probably a stupid question, but because so my understanding is that most of what we care about in terms of um, passing to um, all of the various uh, control loops is sort of sub twenty hertz sort of information. Um, given that all of the work that with the the or the notch filters is 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 you know, filtering like generally is, is filtering the higher frequencies, um, it, you know, or is my understanding correct then? Is that like, um, do, do we actually need to care so much about how clean the higher frequencies are because the, the lower control, you know, the controllers are looking at sort of sub 20 Hertz. Is that fair? So it, it's depends on the size of the copter. So the smaller you go, the more important the higher frequencies become. I, and, and I'm sure Leonard can give me a, give a better answer than this. Mm -hmm. um, so what you find is if you filter at very low frequencies on these smaller copters, um, they're just not, you get a lot of glitching. So the thing is, it's not, it's not about your input, it's about how um, RG Pilot itself is able to control sort of some of these smaller, uh, small, smaller pieces. Um, Leonard, do you want to say something about that? No, I, I just 
<laughs> no, so there's a couple of things going on there. One of them is um, aliasing. Uh, you're not just interested in taking care of the frequencies in your control bandwidth. You're also trying to remove uh, the frequency components that are at your um, Nyquist frequencies like, that will fold back down into your control bandwidth. Um, so we, uh, that's why we run the harmonic notch at um, the higher gyro input rates. So we can actually filter them out before we subsample down to say 400 Hertz, or I'm not sure what you're running there. Andy, uh, sorry, Andy, you're running at a uh, thousand Hertz there on? The loop rate. Yeah, loop rate. 800 Hertz, yeah. 800 Hertz. So, so for Andy, um, uh, his you you were saying two hundred hertz ish for your uh, for your primary. Yes. Yeah. So for Andy, it doesn't take much with a with a throttle punch to actually get those uh, the second harmonic sitting right at eight hundred hertz, which will immediately mix down to a a, a DC offset um, for his for for his aircraft, and he'll start to see the leans where um, the, the aircraft will pull to one side as that harmonic passes through uh, 800 Hertz. Um, the, other, the other aspect of the high frequency noise um, is that it comes through to your commanded output to your ESCs. And um, although the, the uh, especially, on, especially on larger aircraft, um, the aircraft can't, the, the ESCs can't respond to those higher frequency variations. Um, the ESC, it feels like, now I'm getting very subjective here, but it feels like the ESCs are hunting within this noise band of control. So it's almost as if you lose precise control of your ESCs. Now, I don't know what's happening in these various ESCs uh, that, that causes this, um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's as if these ESCs hunt and the aircraft starts um, being imprecise with its reaction to inputs. And um, it, it, yeah, so though the, the harmonics are a critical thing that you can clearly show um, a, mathematically at any level. Um, and then there's this... Uh, grass on your command that tends to just have the ESCs hunting around in this area um, that that starts adding additional disturbances from the con from, from the the motors and propellers themselves that the controllers then have to try and deal with so it is actually very important to deal with these high frequency components and, yeah that, that makes a lot of sense thank thank you the the, the way it, you know practically speaking so um I, I like just trying things and seeing whether they crash. Um, then it gives me a hard time for it, but you know, it's, it's one way. <laughs> um, so the, the, the way these, the way it feels is very, very different. So if you try and run filters hard at 20 minutes say, on one of these small copters, I mean, it probably won't fly, but it will feel like an absolute dog. They're just really, really, really sloppy. So you have to do this precise filtering to get the, the kind of feel that, that you need. And, and um, uh, I mean, Lennon and I have been on this journey for a while and he's looked at a lot of my logs uh, and you know, the, the, the precision has got higher and higher and higher, the more noise that we've been able to, 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 to remove. And, and uh, I think in particular, it, it's in dynamic flight. So when you, you kind of, you know, you're making very aggressive maneuvers, that's when uh, some of these things become particularly important uh, and, you know, prop wash and all those sorts of things. So prop wash is, again, people complain about prop wash. With these sorts of techniques, you can almost completely eliminate the effects of prop wash from a, from a control perspective. Um, just to sort of uh, put what um, Andy said there a slightly different way uh, with when he was referring to the low pass filters versus the harmonic notch filters, in order to remove enough noise to... Uh, to not burn out ESCs on these little aircraft and to reduce these uh, this, the noise power down to a sufficient level to get get 
any level of performance. Um, the latency that you introduce by using low pass filters and filtering out everything above versus using a harmonic filter and, and specifically targeting um, the areas that you need to um, is, is quite dramatic. Um, the, low, the low pass filters have a very, low, very slow sort of cutoff. So in order to actually get them to attenuate the, the, um, these harmonics sufficiently, you have to set them quite low. Um, and then you've added a lot of latency into your controller that then bites you as poor um, PID tuning and low PID gains. Um, and so, yeah, so the harmonic notches allow you to hit these frequencies without introducing um, the significant latencies in your control loops. So on those lines, Leonard, with um, tuning, do you tend to um, try and deal with the higher the noise at the higher frequencies to allow you to uh, increase the um, uh, the low pass filter frequencies on that feed into the controllers? So you know the the uh, filters that we have on our deter, meritum, and targets. Okay. Uh, um... I'll, I'll perhaps I'll say how I do think about this as opposed to trying to answer that question. But um, I, I, I have no reservation in, in saying that the work Andy has done it, with the FFT is the single biggest uh, control improvement that we've had for the last few years. Um, oh, yeah, I completely recognize that. And please, no, no, please yeah. don't, so that don't wasn't, interpret that my, my, my question yeah. as a criticism at all. Yeah. No, no, no. I wasn't even suggesting that that was, that was, a, criti that was a criticism. So that my follow-on statement, um, it, my first thing that I do when I do a tune, so after setting the expo and actually getting those basic parameters set up properly for, to linearize the thrust, um, the second thing I do once I actually can get an aircraft hovering is I set the uh, harmonic uh, the harmonic notch based on the throttle. Um, now Andy's given us a few more options that we can we can evaluate, um, and then I look at how much noise I've got left over to deal with with the low pass filters, um, and I then adjust the low pass. I try and get the low pass filters high enough if I can. If there if there's enough if if um, the noise uh, performance is sufficient um, such that they aren't impacting my tune. Um, and then it's just a compromise of, okay, how much additional low pass filter do I need to, to trade off between what I refer to as a noise limited tune and a performance limited tune. A performance limited tune is where the low pass filters are not having a, 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 a significant impact on our tuning. If we increase them or double them, we do not see a, a significant change in our PID parameters. Um, uh, whereas a noise limited tune is I'm having to reduce those, uh, those filter frequencies for the low pass filters, the gyro double two pole second order low pass filter and the D term low pass filter and perhaps even the E-term um, low pass filter in order to manage the amount of noise that we've got. And what the work that Andy's done with the FFTs allows us to push that back significantly. Um, so I, I, I know I haven't quite answered your question. No, but... you, you have, you have yeah. that definitely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much both. And apologies for going way over time. No problem at all. No, that's that was great. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, much appreciated. And um, so um, if there's no more questions, we'll move on. And uh, so our next talk, uh, we are going to have be treated to a talk about six off copters by Pete Hall. And uh, just hang on a second, Pete, while I organize the recording to flip the recording over. All right, all done. So, Pete, uh, whenever you're ready. Right, I'll uh, I'll see if I can share this. Uh, hopefully, you can all see that. Yep, all good. Cool. 
So I'm going to be doing uh, a little talk. I mean, should we go straight into it, or, or do people want a, a couple of minutes? Um, I'm inclined to go straight into it, unless there's do other people want to want a break. No, nope, I, I think we jump straight in. Cool. Yeah, so I'm going to be doing a, a talk uh, about six off copters. So. Uh, we're going to assume uh, you've all uh, seen that video, uh, <laughs> so you won't get to see it again. Uh, so uh, firstly, I thought I'd sort of just go over a bit about what do we actually mean by uh, degrees of freedom and, and sort of what are we gaining uh, with our extra going from uh, what we have at the moment. So at the moment, uh, this is just uh, a, a quadcopter. Uh, obviously. So we have our four degrees of freedom that we can control our normal quadcopter in. Uh, so obviously we've got thrust and it's sort of half a degree of freedom because we can only thrust up. You can't thrust uh, down. Uh, so we've got thrust and then obviously roll, pitch and yaw. And uh, that's, that's sort of full degrees of freedom because you can roll both ways and pitch both ways. Uh, so that is our four degrees of sort of spatial uh, degrees of freedom. So that's how we can uh, move the vehicle about. And then to achieve, achieve that, we have de like degrees of actuation. So we have four degrees of actuation on a, a copter. So obviously you've got your four um, motors. So uh, in this case, uh, our spatial degrees of freedom it, it equals our actuation uh, degrees uh, of freedom. Uh, and you'll see that's a, a bit of a theme. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. So this is a, a tricopter. Uh, again, we've got the same four spatial degrees of freedom that we can, can move in. Oh, and I should have said at the beginning, like, any questions, just jump in as we go uh, and get stuck in. Uh, so that's a, our tricopter. Uh, and again, we've got four degrees of actuation. So we've lost a motor that we did have on our quadcopter and we've swapped it in. Uh, for a survey. Uh, and again, our spatial degrees of freedom equals our actuation uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, and then a bicopter. So we've got the same thrust roll pitch, uh, yaw, and we've swapped another motor for another survey. Uh, so we've got two motors, two surveys. So we've still got the same amount of, of actuation degrees of freedom. So uh, you'll see that, that that's a limit. We need at least the, the number of actuators as, as spatial degrees of freedom. Uh, but of course, uh, many times vehicles have more actuators. So this is an octocopter. Uh, so we still only have four degrees of freedom, uh, even though we've got eight uh, actuators. So in this case, we've got uh, more actuation uh, than uh, degrees of, of freedom that we can move in. So. Why would you do that? Surely, if you can only use four motors, why would you not just use four? So uh, it gives you redundancy. So because we, we, we know we need at least four, if we've got eight, that means, you know, theoretically, we could lose four motors and still be able to fly. But obviously, uh, it doesn't work out like that uh, in practice. Uh, there's packaging reasons you might want to, to, to do that. Maybe you need uh, more, uh, you need to get it all compact or or you can't get the enormous propellers that you want to build your enormous vehicle. So you, you need to use uh, more smaller ones and then response time. So if you uh, sort of small propellers change direction and, and spin up and down faster than, than huge big ones. Uh, and response is also important for like on our, on our tricopter and bicopter, like the servo response is, is makes a, a big difference and the, and the servo won't respond nearly as fast as the, as the motors will. So maybe you're, you're better sort of choosing a different combination, even though you're, you're then an over-actuated over uh, system. And interestingly, you can in fact get under-actuated systems. So this is a bit of a tangent, but I, I think it's quite interesting. So you can, you can trade off static stability. So because we, haven't, we, we, we don't match our spatial degrees of freedom to our actuation degrees of freedom, you can't be statically stable. So you can't hover in one spot anymore. You have to move. So, so if, if I was to jump and you took a picture, you would, you would know I can't, I can't hover. I'm not hovering uh, in space. I'm, I'm dynamically uh, in space. So we, you, you, you can 
sort of get more than you 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 put in by by making a system that's dynamically stable. You you can punch again, punch above your your actuation degrees of freedom. Uh, so both of these uh, examples uh, constantly spin. Uh, so it's the uh, Lock, Lockheed uh, Samurai. So it's a uh, one motor, one servo, uh, and it can move about in uh, three degrees of, of freedom. So it can go up and down, and then it can translate, uh, you know, left, right, forwards, backwards. Uh, but but you can't, uh, you know, you can't control your obviously because it has to spin the whole time uh, for it to work. And then another one that uh, is uh, quite interesting and it is a sort of quadcopter motor failover. So if you were to lose a motor on a quadcopter, you can you can transition into this dynamic stability by spinning the copter around, uh, and then that might be just enough to to get you home. Uh, but obviously, it's not it's not ideal. Uh, but as a, as a sort of fail safe, uh, it's 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 really handy and, and it's fantastically cool as well. Uh, so that's a sort of overview of uh, degrees of freedom. And of course, RG5 actually already does six degree of freedom uh, vehicles. So RG sub, uh, this is uh, the blue uh, ROV2. And you can see it's got some thrusters here for going up and down. And then it's got four uh, thrusters, uh, uh, you know, front, back at angles like this. Uh, so it can uh, translate uh, without um, rolling and pitching. Uh, so it's <laughs> we we have actually been doing six DOS uh, vehicles for ages in uh, in Arduino Pilot. Uh, so to make a six DOS vehicle, we know that we want it to be sort of statically stable. So we know that we need more than six motors. So six would be our minimum number of uh, well, not motors, six actuators. Obviously, you could use uh, a fewer number of motors and have them on tilts or use flaps or something. But if we just want to use motors, we need six motors. Uh, for static uh, stability. Uh, and then this gets us our same thrust, but in this case, to be a true six DOF vehicle, you need to be able to thrust both up and down. So that's uh, sort of an enhancement over the existing copters. We need to be able to thrust in both directions. And then obviously roll pitch and you're exactly the same. And then our two additional degrees of freedom. So this is what takes us from a normal four DOF copter to up to six DOF is these forward, back, uh, let, uh, and lateral, left, right, uh, thrust. So we can then move in our full uh, six degree of freedom uh, space. Uh, and as I said, we, need, we know we need six actuators and to be a true six DOF vehicle, our actuators need to be able to thrust in both directions. So at the moment, uh, ArduPilot only really understands forward off vehicles. And if you think about uh, sort of how uh, ArduPilot sees the vehicle, the, the main navigation code and even the attitude control code doesn't actually know very much about the vehicle. It doesn't know if you've got a, a quadcopter or a tricopter or a bicopter. It just knows that if it wants to go forward, it should pitch forward. That's, that's sort of baked into the code at, at, at quite a low level. So it just says, I want to go a bit forward, I'll rotate my thrust vector. And I think the sort of key to understanding how the six degree of freedom vehicle works is to sort of imagine you've got X-ray sunglasses and you, you can't see the vehicle, but you can see its thrust vector. So you can just imagine that the, 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 the thrust vector moves uh, and don't think about the, what vehicle the thrust vector is coming out of. Uh, so because we, we, we don't really care about uh, what the actual vehicle is, we can just imagine the thrust vector moving. So we can, on our six degree of freedom vehicle, we don't actually have to move the thrust vector with the vehicle. We can just pivot the thrust vector, but the vehicle stays level. Uh, and as I say, this is really the, the key concept to, to understand how this works, is that we don't have to move the vehicle to move the thrust vector. And, and that assumption is, is you know, baked into basically every multi-rotor ever. Uh, but on this vehicle, we, we, we can break that assumption. 
Uh, but as I say, the, the underlying code doesn't, it can't, it can't tell. It just thinks you're, you're still a, a mystery multi-copter that uh, has rotated its, its, its pitch, uh, it, its thrust vector. So really the six degree of freedom vehicle uh, at the moment anyway, is just pretending to be a four degree of freedom copter and only the new six degree of freedom attitude control library and the uh, AP Motors uh, six degree of freedom code. Those are the only two libraries that actually realize that, oh, I've not actually pitched the vehicle, I've just moved the thrust vector. So that be because nothing higher up in the code actually needs to understand that, which means that auto and loiter and RTL, they all just work uh, automatically, uh, basically, bec because they're, they're using roll and pitch as a proxy for rotating the thrust vector. And then we just uh, sort of back calculate, we remove the roll and pitch and rotate the thrust vector as the same amount. And uh, actually results in some quite interesting stuff if you go and look at like position control logs um, when the vehicle's upside down, because like the target velocity will be, it's still in body frame. So the target velocity is actually in the opposite direction to the target position but then it all gets rotated back. So the, the, the high level code doesn't need to understand, but uh, it's all a bit weird because uh, you know sometimes it looks like the vehicle's trying to fly away from where it's getting to, but it's all upside down. So it, it comes right uh, in the end. And of course, because we can rotate the, the thrust vector relative to the vehicle, it means we can just rotate the vehicle and keep the thrust vector pointing up. And again, the higher level code really doesn't need to know. It, it, what it doesn't know doesn't hurt it. So we just carry on pretending to be a normal four degree of freedom copter that is perfectly level or pitched forward if we're moving forward. Uh, and as I say, really, that, that sort of step that we, we take, we just don't tell the high level controllers. Uh, and and it all just works, uh, which I think is is sort of the uh, I don't know. It's it's the it's the key the key assumption or the key jump that we have to make that makes this all work uh, very simply without uh, without having to like completely reprogram the the position controller and completely change our, our PID system and things like that. So we we just pretend that we we're, we're just a normal copter uh, and and. And we can actually get away with it, and it, it of course it it brings a few constraints, but actually the constraints are not that bad, uh, and we will cover that a bit uh, at the end. So in order to set this up uh, in Arduino Pilot, hey, it's Peter. all in. Hey. hey, Peter, it's Bill. Hey, um, so now how do you, how have you changed your um, controller, like on the controller side, like the person making the control inputs uh, has their controls um, and what they mean or what they do change. So, and so does, does lateral stick still mean rolling the aircraft or how does, how does that change? So uh, at the moment, lateral stick means we re-rotate this imaginary copter that the vehicle's pretending to be. And so we just move the thrust vector. So at the moment, if you if you were to take off and just fly about like you would fly a normal copter, the vehicle would then stay completely level, and it just sort of shoots sideways in a very weird and unintuitive way <laughs> that takes a little while getting used to. Does that uh, does that so cover your? Go ahead and say that last part again. I'm not sure I caught, caught that. So it, it just stays completely level. So, you, so, so you, if you were to have your, your X-ray sunglasses that could see thrust vectors, it would look exactly the same. It's just the vehicle stays level and the thrust vector rotates. So you pitch forward, the vehicle doesn't pitch forward, the thrust vector pitches forward. Okay, so, so now you're basically controlling translational rate with, your, with, the, with the elevator and aileron sticks. Yeah, ex exactly right, exactly right. Okay. And as I say, right. if you if you had magic sunglasses that could see thrust vectors, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Uh, it's just we we can unlink the thrust vector from from the vehicle attitude. 
Cool, thanks. Yeah, so this is how you set it up. It's all in master uh, now, 4.1 dev. Uh, the only constraint is that you must have a scripting uh, capable flight controller. Uh, so you just need uh, at least uh, two meg of uh, a flesh space. So the frame class is a, a new frame class 16. Uh, and in the uh, parameter description, it's called sixed off scripting. So basically because these frames are so complicated, uh, I decided there's there's basically no point in having, like as we do for normal frame classes, we have like copter X and H and, and a whole bunch of, of pre-existing ones that you can just pick from. But because these vehicles are so weird, basically we wouldn't, you know, we would never get the defaults right. They just, w w w they wouldn't apply to, they wouldn't be universal enough to apply to everyone's vehicle. So you have to load, you have to uh, generate your own mixer uh, because they are very specific to vehicles. So uh, we use scripting instead of adding, you know, hundreds of params, we use scripting as a, as a nice easy way to load a lot of data into the motors library. So it understands the, the shape of the vehicle as it were. Uh, so you use this new uh, motor six off add motor command in your Lua script. Uh, and this, uh, how many lines is this? Uh, seven lines is what you need to set up the vehicle. So you have a little Lua script, it loads in all this data it, and it sets up the motors and then it goes away. So you don't, the, the Lua script is literally an, a, a knit thing. It just sets up the motors and, and, and clears off. Uh, so we use this function uh, add motor and then we've got motor zero. So that's the first motor. Uh, and then obviously we, we go one uh, to five and brilliantly the motor number is zero indexed. And then at the end, we've got testing order, which is one indexed just to confuse everyone. Uh, so uh, in almost all cases, you want the, the motor number and testing order here at the end to match. Uh, so it, except we've obviously got that index offset, uh, but you, you if testing order is a bit of a, you, that's just like, if you go in mission plan and go test motor A, that's these numbers at the end of the order. Uh, but I think in almost all cases, you just want them to match. So that's uh, the, the sort of uh, setup stuff. And then we've got six numbers, which sort of define the contributions of this motor to each of our six spatial degrees of freedom. So we've got you know, roll, pitch, yaw, throttle, forward, and then right. So that's our attitude factors and then our uh, sort of direction factors. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, bit here is just a, a Boolean true false. So uh, on my vehicle, all the motors are reversible. So they can thrust in both directions. So that just tells RG pilots that no throttle is at 1500 PWM instead of zero uh, or rather a thousand PWM. Uh, so, you can actually do, uh, if you wanted to, uh, of course, I've, I've not tried it, but you could do a combination of reversible and not reversible motors uh, and, and things like that. And of course, you could just set up a normal quad in, with this, this exact mixer. You would just have zeros in the forward and right uh, column. So these last two columns would all be zeros. Uh, the thr thrust would all be ones. And then you'd have your like roll pitch and your factors uh, just as you do in the normal AP motors uh, library. Oh, and it's worth mentioning as well, you can do custom normal frame types uh, in almost this exact way. So it's uh, a slightly different handle and then you don't give it uh, the, you just do the, the angular uh, factors. So if you've got some uh, normal four degree of freedom multi-copter, you can actually set up uh, the motors with this same uh, or, or rather a very similar method. So we tell motors that uh, it has uh, six motors and this is the position they're all in. Um, and then we tell it that it should now init and it should have had six motors. So we just uh, tell it to init and, and make sure it has had six motors. So we don't you know, accidentally forget to load one and then uh, tell it to init. Uh, so that is how you sort of set up and you configure your custom uh, frame.
And then once you've done that, you can then use a, a second Lua script to uh, sort of change the attitude of the vehicle. So because RGPilot does only understand four degrees of freedom, uh, there's sort of no way to, to with normal, uh, normal inputs that RGPAR understands, there's no way to control these extra two degrees of freedom that we have. And unless your, you know, your transmitter's got an extra stick on it over here, like you can't, you can't input stuff. So uh, instead I, I went for just making it accessible by a, a, a script. So first of all, you can use this set lateral enable and set forward enable. So if you set these both to false, your six degree of freedom vehicle changes back to a four degree of freedom vehicle, the thrust vector is always up and it rotates the vehicle again. And well, although it doesn't make much sense for a six degree of freedom vehicle, you could, for example, do a five degree of freedom vehicle that could say, hold its pitch level whilst moving forward and backwards. So you would uh, set a forward enable to true and lateral enable to false. So you would still have to roll to go sideways, but you could, I go forwards and backwards while staying level. So you can do, uh, you, you can sort of drop down from six degree of freedom if you want to uh, in a script. And of course you can do this based on like an RC switch or, or oh, I'm in auto mode, I want six degree of freedom. I'm now in, in stabilize, I want this other uh, thing. So, so making it accessible to scripting lets you do uh, lots of clever uh, stuff. And then of course you can set this offset roll and pitch. So that's how we control the vehicle in its roll and pitch. So as I say, because we can't do it from the sticks, uh, we use a script. And of course you could use the script to bind it back to the sticks if you wanted to. Um, and this offset is then just directly applied to the, the target uh, attitude. So uh, the attitude controller just, just adds it on to what we're asking for from RGPilot uh, and, and it all just works, uh, which is quite uh, satisfying that we can just add sort of a roll and pitch offset and, and the existing attitude controller just, just deals with it. Uh, so in my uh, demo videos, I was just doing sort of roll equals less roll plus some number. So it just rolls at a, a constant rate uh, from a script and then you have a little switch to, to turn it off. Uh, so there's also this <laughs> bit of a, a, a trap here, which is uh, ATC angle boost. So you have to turn this off because uh, there's a singularity at 90 degrees. So if, you, uh, <laughs> if you're happily turning your six degree of freedom vehicle upside down with angle boost turned on, uh, when you go past 90 degrees, uh, the throttle goes away <laughs> because there's this uh, singularity in the way that angle boost works. Uh, so you have to remember and uh, turn that off. And because when we're in six degree of freedom control, we actually ignore the, these roll and pitch offsets. We don't pay any attention to those when we're setting our thrust vector. We just go, oh, well, uh, thrust is always up. Uh, so we rotate it or rotate the thrust vector such that thrust is always up, which means that in theory, you actually don't need attitude control to be able to fly your six degree of freedom vehicle, uh, you know, forwards, backwards, left, right. So it's a bit like those, uh, those uh, sort of uh, non-statically stable systems. So theoretically you can turn your roll pitch, your PIDs to zero and the vehicle will still fly around fine. Uh, but of course in practice, it'll build up quite a big like roll rate or something and you'll end up spinning really fast. Uh, and then the motors can't change direction fast enough and it'll all, all go wrong. But it, it's, it's quite a nice way to just confirm that uh, like your, all your rotations are correct. So I, I did this as a sort of a, a way to test it and I thought it was quite fun that it, that it even works, that you can actually fly the vehicle with no attitude control. So you saw my big matrix of numbers. So how do we, how do we come up with, with those numbers? Uh, so there are a few uh, considerations. So all of the uh, existing RGPilot mixers don't consider that motor torque and motor thrust might be 
acting on uh, like more than one XSOR. So, so on a normal quadcopter, pitch is controlled by a change in thrust only, roll is controlled by a change in thrust only, and yaw is controlled by a torque only. So you, you don't have to deal with thrust and torque contributing to one uh, axis. So that is a, a, a thing that uh, makes it a little bit more, more complicated. And of course, on a, a sort of normal vehicle, you can't do roll pitch or yaw if you also want to do zero throttle. You, you have to pick and choose a bit more. So you, you, can, you might have to, uh, and we actually do this at the moment in the code, which is if, if you're trying to pitch really hard and you've got a big attitude error, it'll bump up the throttle. And of course, on a six degree of freedom vehicle, uh, we don't necessarily have to have to do that because we can roll and roll pitch and yaw whilst applying no uh, thrust vector uh, if we wanted to. So the the key thing for understanding this this sort of combinations of thrust and torque to to act on one axis. So I think that the clearest example here, and you can see this is a, a sort of representation of an example, a motor layout. So it's just uh, a sort of, uh, if you imagine a sort of origin, all these lines are at a sort of 90 degrees uh, in space. And then at the end of each uh, sort of axis here, you've got a motor. And then at the other end of the axis at 90 degrees is a second motor. So pitch would be sort of uh, along uh, this uh, axis, so this uh, between motor one and five, that would uh, stay in the same plane, that would be pitch. And you can straight away see that motor one contributes to pitch by thrust, but motor five contributes to pitch with its torque. Uh, so here the motors are colored for rotation uh, direction, uh, although it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make a huge difference what uh, rotation direction you pick. Uh, so long as they're not all the same uh, uh, in this in this particular layout, of course, in in other motor layouts it might be quite different. So first, the key thing was to benchmark what our thrust and torque values are. Uh, so uh, for this, Matt uh, has built a lovely uh, thrust test stand, and you can see here it's got on uh, this reversible propeller that I used uh, for my uh, vehicle. So we. Uh, did some testing to benchmark that. And this Matt's a fantastic stand and you'll have to wait until tomorrow to, to hear a bit more about that uh, in his talk. So then we got this, this lovely uh, data set. So the first thing, uh, I was quite impressed with this. We, uh, you know, this is thrust versus throttle uh, for forwards. And then we reversed the motor and reverse the prop so that the, the sort of thrust was in the same way, that, but the prop was going backwards. So actually it is, it is a 3D propeller. It truly is that it, it lines up really well uh, in both directions. So it's nice and symmetrical for thrust. And actually that's uh, quite important for, for how the, the code works at the moment, that it is nice and symmetrical. And then again, uh, torque and oh, current and voltage. So. First, the, the key thing is that I was quite impressed how how symmetrical this this uh, 3D propeller is, uh, and I I suspect you have to be a bit uh, careful uh, that they are nice and, and symmetrical because some of the sort of ones uh, you might want for sort of multi race quad flying they're mainly meant for the right way up, and sometimes you might thrust backwards a bit, uh, and then we we benchmark the maximum thrust and the maximum torque. So 1.2 kilograms of, of thrust and uh, 0 0.01 uh, kilogram meters of, of torque. Uh, and of course, because we've got lovely thrust test, test, test data, uh, you might as well calculate the expo. Uh, so uh, a little bit unusually, so you, un typically you would use a spin min and spin max, but because our motor has to reverse, your spin min has to be zero. Uh, so that uh, you know it smoothly reverses. You you can't jump from ten percent to minus ten. So your spin min has to be zero. And then we just do a, a best fit on the uh, uh, expo here. So this is a mot thrust uh, expo. Uh, 
I did this uh, in MATLAB, but uh, if you go and look on the wiki, there's a, a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet that will um, help you do this. So then uh, a bit of a, a MATLAB file to do all the hard work. So we give it the position of all the motors. So that's sort of the center of the motor where the thrust vector uh, would be acting uh, effectively. We give it the direction of the thrust vector. So uh, like this thrust vector would be uh, uh, zero X, one Y and uh, zero Z. So it's just unit uh, thrust vectors uh, to sort of define what direction the motor is pointing in. Uh, we give it the motor rotation direction. So I think here green is, is uh, clockwise and red would be counterclockwise. So that rotation direction just uh, matters because that is the direction or it defines the direction that the torque will be uh, applied in. So then we take our maximum torque and thrust and because we've done that uh, expo calibration, we can assume that uh, the thrust is linear. So we give it uh, a throttle of 100%. It will make say uh, 10 forces force units. And if we give it uh, a throttle of 50%, it will make 50 force units. So that uh, linear relationship that, that this expo uh, lets us uh, assume is key to calculating the, the mixer properly. Uh, and of course, it also means that the change in thrust between 0 and 5% is the same change in thrust between 95 and 100, uh, which is, is key to getting the PIDs to, to, to work across a whole range of uh, throttle values. Uh, so then from these positions and vectors uh, and the max thrust and torque, we assemble a matrix to go from roll pitch your throttle forward right inputs to the motor outputs. So you would give it, uh, say, a throttle input, and it would go, oh, you need to apply some throttle to say one, two, and three. And of course, we can also go back the other way with the same matrix. So you can say, oh, what, have, wh what will the vehicle do if I give it 100% throttle on motor five? Uh, and obviously intuitively you can say, oh, well, it'll probably, you're round and it will move uh, to the right in the negative right direction. So we can intuitively say that for motor five because it's nice and lined up with one of the axes, but obviously all combinations of that uh, is, is nice to, to be able to just automate it. Uh, so this is the sort of naive mixer that that, that gives you. Uh, so uh, you can, you could, you could sort of intuit this as well. Like you can straight away see that throttle is only motor one, two, and three. They have some Z component in their thrust vector. Motors four, five, and six don't have any Z component in their thrust vector. So if we ask for throttle, they won't do anything. Uh, and again, so for right, you can see motor five that we were just talking about, that has a one in its, uh, in its right uh, motor, uh, factor here. So that is 100% uh, going right. Uh, and then your is quite an interesting one because you can see that the top motors, all the thrust vector acts directly in your. So we have, uh, 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 yeah, the top motors, which is uh, four, five, and six at the bottom on this table. So we have big numbers here because the thrust is acting to your the vehicle, but motors one, two, and three is small numbers, uh, about 10 times less. And that's because it's the motor torque that is acting to rotate the vehicle. Uh, so I think this is sort of quite an intuitive table. And for things like quadcopters and fairly uh, straightforward uh, layouts, like you don't even need to do all this math, it's all very intuitive and you can just write the numbers in. But obviously for this, these six degree of freedom vehicles, you know, you, you need a bit of help. Well, I certainly needed a bit of help. So um, we uh, came up with this little sort of mixer to, to help. And, and of course we can, we, we now uh, have the, the calculation to go from inputs to motor outputs and back again. 
So we can see using that sort of naive mixer, if we input roll, so these graphs are each for a uh, an input of uh, like minus one to one. So we got a graph for roll, a graph for pitch, a graph for your throttle forward, right? So if we input only roll, we use uh, the uh, matrix, we go, oh, well, I've got one in this column, zero, 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 zero. So we go one times uh, 0.2, one times minus 0.5. Uh, so uh, you can see, uh, you know, that's um, a minus uh, 0.5 there. Um, so that is uh, what this graph is. So we, we put in uh, a roll, we go to what our motor outputs would be, and then we go back through the same matrix and we come back to what does that then make the vehicle do? So in fact, if we put in a roll, you can see actually we also get some forward input. Uh, and I think perhaps the most intuitive uh, one of these is pitch. So if we go and look back at the, the sort of diagram of the vehicle, you can see to pitch up, we would throttle up this front motor and that has some thrust vector in the forward direction. So we would move a bit forwards as well. Uh, and, and you can sort of see that for each of these different axes, uh, it's not a very big contribution, but another quite intuitive one I think is throttle. So on throttle, we already know we only throttle up these bottom three motors. And you can see that we have two going in one direction and one going in the other direction. So obviously there'll be, if we throttle them all up equally, there'll be a net or there'll be a torque difference of one motor's worth of, of torque. So we're bound to yaw a little bit when we throttle up. So that's sort of what this graph or these graphs represent. And you can see uh, if we put in roll, we get uh, sort of 58% roll and minus 20% forward. Uh, so this is all the cross coupling between axes. And of course, because uh, we've got now got a, a nice error function for this problem, basically, we can optimize that. So uh, of course, we've got six motors and six sort of known values. So you could also just solve the equations. Uh, but if I wanted to then do seven motors, you can't solve the equations anymore. So we've got a, a nice error function here. So uh, I just used uh, a, a a basic, whoop, <laughs> an optimizer, uh, a particle swarm in this case. So we, uh, I just use that as the error function and we go for roll, I want only a roll output. So so basically the we, we bake into the mixer some feed forward between axes. So we, the mixer understands that if it puts in roll, it should also put in uh, like minus 20% throttle to exactly cancel out that, that throttle. So it's, it's basically feed forward between axes, except we bake it right into the mixer so that you don't have to like, like obviously you could, we could add a bunch of parameters uh, for feed forward between axes and you could go and calculate them all uh, and tune them all up in, in, in the, you know, like as you're tuning the vehicle, but we can, we can jump sort of straight there by baking it right into the mixer uh, with this uh, optimization. Uh, so, so that is, is, I think, a sort of a key thing and it sort of helps the, well, like it will, it will totally still fly on this naive mixer, but uh, you get more cross coupling between axes and you can't turn up the PID controllers as much because they all sort of stop, they all get in a fight. Like <laughs> you'll roll, will be trying to do something, but that'll affect pitch. So you end up all your PID controllers are fighting, uh, and it, it, and because of that you can't turn up the gains as much as you would like. But if we do this nice uh, optimization, we we remove all that cross coupling right in the mixer, and then the PIDs no longer get in a fight with each other, and we can turn up the gains uh, a bit more. So this is our sort of corrected uh, mixer. So uh, you can see we've no longer got zeros in this uh, for, the, for our top motors in throttle. So even though they haven't got any thrust vector in the up, up down direction, um, they have 
uh, a little bit uh, of throttle come on when you when you try and go up. So that is just to cancel out that one motor's worth of, of torque. Uh, and of course, uh, it's it's the same. It, it, I think it's not it's so intuitive to sort of understand for a, a lots of these axes, but it's uh, all uh, the same uh, the same idea. Uh, and then, so the only other thing we then do is we scale it to uh, 0.5. So the the roll pitch, and you're all scaled. So the maximum number in here is uh, an absolute value of, of 0.5. And then the throttle forward right columns are all scaled. So the maximum number is uh, an absolute value of one. And and the scaling uh, really is it's not that important from a uh, like a one-off point of view. Like all that matters is that this number times whatever your PID's output is the same. So we could have, you know, we could have 10 in here. And if we divided the PIDs by 10, it would all fly exactly the same. But if we apply this scaling in the mixer and it's consistent, so if you go and fudge the mixer, you still have a maximum scaling of one here and 0.5 for all pitch in your, it makes the PIDs still apply roughly the same. Uh, and the other reason is that they we use a maximum of 0.5 for the normal copter mixer. And, and by using 0.5 here, the default PIDs apply reasonably well. Uh, obviously, they're not perfect, but it, it it gets us so the PIDs are in sort of the recommended range of the existing parameters, uh, which uh, is quite nice. Uh, so that's how we calculate the the magic mixer. And and that's more or less all there is to it. It's, it's, it's the sort of thing that uh, one assumes is very complicated, but, but, but basically there's, there's just the one sort of key thing to the code, which is this unlinking of, of thrust vector and uh, attitude. And once we've unlinked those, suddenly you can do all this other stuff. And actually the, the patch to enable six stuff is not as big and it's not as complicated as you might imagine. We just have to, we just trick the higher level codes into thinking that we're still afford our vehicle uh, and then uh, just deal with the extra degrees of freedom in the mixer uh, and in the attitude control uh, library. So there's, uh, well, is there any questions on what we've done so far before we, before we cover a future work? Everyone's baffled. Oh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> It I'm, is very uh, cool. Yes. And I hadn't realized that optimization at all when you uh, when I sort of saw the previous videos and things. That's really fascinating the way you you counteract the effects in the other axes. And that immediately just made me start to think of quad planes. And I now see you've got a photo of a quad plane up there, a very, very old <laughs> quad plane. So uh, yes. I'm starting, but I'm starting to get ahead. Yeah, so go, go for it. No, 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 go, go ahead. So uh, obviously you're going to start thinking about, you know, uh, actually doing this extra half axis on a quad plane and, um, and also with tilt rotors and things as well. That also, if we can calculate, you know, could you do that optimization dynamically if you actually change the rotation? So, you know, when we have complex tilt rotors, do that all dynamically? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh... We uh, we might not necessarily need to. I think the we get we we're getting to spoilers for Tim's talk tomorrow, but um, <laughs> we'll uh, often for 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 you, like you don't need to do the the clever mixer because all this cross coupling is just like a factor of like either sign or cos of your of your like tilt angle. So you don't need all this clever stuff because you 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 know what the values will be because it's just a sort of one axis rotation so yeah future future stuff so actually i think like proper six stuff vehicles um you know very cool but probably actually not fantastically useful in in the real world so i think oh and and actually it's it's quite a bit harder to like the six off vehicle is 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 essentially completely unconstrained by like angle limits and and things like this and i think what will be more useful and actually a little bit harder to implement is is things like this copter so i went and found this is a from 
a DIY drones from you know 10 years ago or something. It's just a, a copter plus one. So something like this is actually, I think, a little bit harder to deal with because it does have constraints. Like, like at some point, for example, you you would be at full throttle on your extra forward motor and you would want to then lean forward a bit to go faster or this motor isn't reversible. So if you go, you can go forwards perfectly level and use this motor, but if you want to go backwards, you can't use this motor and then you have to pitch the vehicle. And I think sort of dealing with constraints of actuators that we would get on, on things like this actually makes this whole code or, or dealing with it all a whole lot more complicated than the sixth off vehicle that is just completely unconstrained by that stuff. Like you want you want roll 180, go for it. <laughs> we can do that. So so I think dealing with these constraints will uh, be quite a bit of extra work. But I think that is really where the benefit of these extra degrees of freedom will be. Like being able to roll and pitch, you know, completely upside down is is not that useful. But maybe you want to be able to to just translate whilst level uh, and and we we get a bit of extra degree of freedom but but not that much and maybe only in one direction uh, and of course you know what does this this vehicle remind you of <laughs> four motors in one axis and one motor in another axis oh it's just a quad plane you know so we can we can potentially use the same stuff with a quad plane and quad plane has a bit of an attempt at this with its um, forward throttle uh, gain, but we could take advantage of that a, a little bit more. Uh, so the other thing is like at the moment, copters assume all your motors are, are exactly the same size. So you've got this one expo value and for these six off vehicles or, or things like this quad plane, maybe you would want some big rotors that you do in your normal orientation, but then oh, I want to pitch up a bit and you have some smaller rotors that you wouldn't use as much, or you, you might want to mix and match motors uh, sizes a lot more than you would on a normal uh, multi-rotor. So maybe we, we would need multiple uh, expo values so we can deal with motors of a different size. And you might also want uh, like multiple thrust, maximum thrust levels. So for example, you might have a copter that is largely optimized for flying the right way up. So it's got nice, efficient propellers for that orientation. But you can also fly upside down if you like. But now your nice, efficient propellers are not so efficient because they're you know, optimized for one direction. Uh, so you have to deal with them having like asymmetric uh, thrust, uh, depending on the rotation direction and, and, and things like that. So uh, again, sort of the first two things are sort of sort of to better deal with constraints of actuators so we can use them on more practical vehicles uh, and and again for more practical vehicles at the moment um, the only vehicle that has flown with this has used six reversing motors uh, and that is quite a big constraint in that you can only get like true 3d propellers in a sort of five inch size uh, and if you go much bigger than that, even if you could get the propeller, suddenly reversing takes too much time because your inertia goes up in your propeller and you just can't reverse it quickly enough to be able to control uh, the vehicle. So uh, again, actuator constraints. Uh, and at the moment, it's, it's theoretically possible to do non-reversing motors, but it, it's never been tested. Uh, so better mode support would be another one. So at the moment, for example, if you just switch into acro mode, it just goes, oh, I'm just a normal Ford off copter. Uh, so for example, if you're rolling upside down and you switch into acro, you know, bad things will happen. Um, like it, you, you can still fly in acro, it just, it just doesn't understand those extra degrees of freedom uh, in the same way that uh, like stabilize out hold, loiter and, and the higher modes do. And I think another big hurdle to this, this work is that although the vehicle can totally do crazy stuff, it's it's very difficult to control it in an intuitive way. So as I say, you you'd need an extra stick on your transmitter, and you'd have to you know be able to fly with you know your eyes pointing in different directions and and, and stuff. So 
what we need perhaps is something, you know, a bit like Copter's drift mode or something where the, the extra degrees of freedom are just sort of dealt with in quite an intuitive way. Uh, and, oh, and because we can control them with scripting, oh, we don't have to do that in the main code. So we can prototype that all in scripting and, and try and, and sort of take advantage of the extra degrees of freedom that we gain without making it hugely complicated to fly or super difficult to, to program missions. Uh, so I think uh, Peter actually had a good idea in this direction. So for example, we could use the gimbal controller to control the roll and pitch. So for example, you could do like a region of interest uh, and the copter would fly about in the circle or whatever. And then the roll and pitch control would be done a bit like a gimbal. Uh, but of course that only really works if, if you know, you're in auto modes, otherwise the, <laughs> the pilot will get very confused. I've taken to flying this, uh, my one in, in simple mode because then it doesn't, you have to sort of unlearn. It took me quite a few, <laughs> few flights to get used to it, to unlearn keeping orientation and go back to <laughs> like not caring about the orientation of the vehicle, but it makes it a bit easier to fly and you, you can't really lose orientation anymore once you've, you've sort of unlearned <laughs> normal flying. So the, uh, another enhancement would be true sixth off position control. So at the moment, like, we're, we're still pretending to be a six off copter underneath, a four off copter rather. So for example, the six off vehicle can thrust downwards. So you can do faster than one G descents if you wanted to uh, while staying level. And that is something that the higher level like position control, the Z controller, they just don't understand that. They don't think it's possible. And uh, another one uh, at the moment, you can only go sideways with the same thrust as you have downwards. Uh, and that's just because we're, we're pretending to be this, this vehicle that is just a, a four off vehicle with its thrust vector. So in reality, we could go sideways at, at full throttle whilst uh, descending, uh, but it's not possible to do that the way it is currently. But actually, you know, doing greater than one G descents and shooting sideways at huge speed, even though the vehicle can do it, is perhaps a bit of a, an edge case of, of you know, do, would people actually use that? Uh, and, and I suspect dealing with that stuff properly, would we then have to do the, the massive rewrite of position controller that, that uh, basically our pretending to be a Ford off vehicle has, has bypassed. Uh, so to sort of do it properly, uh, there would be quite a lot of work there. But but whether it brings enough uh, benefit is, is sort of another question. And then I think uh, something that that this could work really well is is VTOL stuff and, and quad planes because uh, as we saw here, you know they're already they already have the motors for this. They they for the most part they're already set up for it. And I think a really cool thing that 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 jumps to mind that we could do. So we can now control the vehicle's attitude independent of its position. So a quad plane hovering in the wind, we could now tilt up while staying in the same position to climb. So we can take advantage of the wind and the lift over the wing. So we can tilt the vehicle up, uh, change its attitude without moving backwards to climb. And then we want to descend. So we could tilt the vehicle down and unload the, the wing to come down. And, and that's actually something that quad planes struggle with quite a lot. So you, people will often find it quite hard to land if it's windy because it's got so much wind under the wing. So you, we could now, uh, you could have a little script that you know moves the, changes the pitch of the vehicle so that the throttle is always at the the same level or, or, or something like that. So we can really take advantage of that. And and for things like transitions as well, you could now say oh, I'm going to be five degrees pitch up for the whole of my transition. Uh, and then uh, you should be able to transition a bit quicker. Uh, so things like that, I think. And again, it's not full six off control. Maybe for quad planes, you only need to sort of unlink your attitude from your thrust vector just for like 10 degrees around zero. So you can just do that angle of attack control in the hover. Um, and I think that's where the sort of real benefit of this stuff will, will come in for, for many more people than 
than the full six star <laughs> silly copters flying upside down stuff, uh, even though that isn't <laughs> great fun. So I, I think that's, uh, that's basically the conclusion of my six star ramblings. Uh, any, any more questions? Yeah, the, the stuff about uh, that you've just been describing about, you mean quad planes optimizing that wing angle. Um, Len and I have already been discussing that a bit uh, when we were doing some of the ship landing work. We were looking at exactly that and um, and trying to do a bit of a controller um, in the quad plane code for for doing that uh, because it's one of the big problems at the moment is it it can be that um, it can be difficult to land, but it also can be that um, you know if it tilts down too much, it ends up you know you overload the motors, the vertical motors get too hot. Um, so you've got a whole lot of these extra constraints, but the speed of the throttle on the forward motor can be a real problem. If it's a petrol forward motor, it may respond fairly slowly, especially at low throttle levels. Um, and so you, you have this sort of extra dimension, if you like, with a, you know, you, uh, you're not as fast in some axes as others. It's very asymmetric. Yeah, I think dealing with these sort of actuator constraints is going to be one of the big hurdles for, for that stuff. Yeah, indeed. But uh, very worthwhile to try and solve it. Um, one of the, uh, if, if I had been a little less tardy with my uh, preparation and didn't have to swap with Randy on my talk, um, I would, uh, a, a bit of a spoiler for my, my talk is that one of the, changes that will go into 4.1 is multi will be running off um, thrust vector plus attitude instead of roll pitch yaw um, for 4.1. So the attitude controller will take in a target thrust vector and a heading as opposed to roll pitch yaw, um, which obviously for you is very easy to extend to uh, thrust vector and roll pitch your or thrust vector and attitude. Um, and so, yeah, it has a, a, a lot of big advantages for multi rotors actually doing it that way because of the paths linking uh, various thrust vector targets as opposed to using Euler angles to link um, to, to to specify thrust vectors results in um, uh, in poor paths between those those angles, especially when you're starting to get attitude errors, um, in particular your errors uh, in 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 that. Uh, and because of what Tridge says, is your um, the your axis is 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 operating on a different time scale to roll and pitch. So by try by including uh, a attitude change to link to target thrust vectors using a using your um, is suboptimal because you have to wait for your to catch up. And if you and so in the attitude controller, we define roll and pitch based on our current your, not our target your, and even to try and account for that, but it only accounts for it somewhat because of the paths that we we attempt to follow. So yeah, so so all of this stuff is hopefully going to sort of come come into a into its own where uh, we can elegantly split out the attitude controller for, like things like um, boost throttle for you shouldn't be in there. Your your uh, you you might you should be able to use most of the attitude controller, but the um, the thrust the three axis thrust vector thing multi rotors really only need one of that. So hopefully we can find a way to slice out uh, if we get if we get that representation right. Hopefully we can find a way to slice out where you can simply override um, uh, aspects of of, of multi or you know I, I'm 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 not the programmer here. I, um, but uh, the, the, the way it's structured, we should make it very easy for, um, for you to, or, or for the these various vehicles to be accommodated. Um, things like the, uh, 
the very it's the, what you're talking about with the forward th facing thrust for example you've only got forward um, facing vectors four quad planes um you know you it shouldn't be too difficult to say if we're wanting to if the thrust vector goes past you know it goes to negative um pitch angles we go to negative pitch angles if it goes to forward pitch angles we increase the forward motor and things like that so um I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of, I hope that there'll be uh, a number of people helping me sort of work out how to do this from a code structural um, uh, perspective, but the, the basic architectures of the, um, of the various controllers are sort of being set up to try and facilitate that step. Um, hopefully, hopefully maybe over the next, next 12 months, but we'll, we'll see how all that comes together. No, that sounds great. And we'll be able to sort of remove my, <laughs> it won't have to pretend to be a four dot anymore. <laughs> we, can, we can just use the, the thrust vector directly. Yeah, there's there's always, gonna, as you say, there's always going to be the, the human interface, which is the challenge. Um, you know, we do have 10 fingers, so, you know, we could handle six maybe, <laughs> but uh, that most of the controllers don't come with the extra, you know. Um, one of the other things that I, I, I thought was interesting about the whole uh, six stop thing is is the motor mixer. Um, uh, now you've you've used uh, a, a pretty simple sort of matrix multiplication to work out um, what's happening, but I, I assume you haven't sort of went in and done a lot of your saturation effects. Um, no, yeah, I'm done. I'm done that was that at all? <laughs> axes prior prioritization. Um, but it's one of those interesting things where with the six, your sixth off vehicle, um, if it loses an actuator and you have simply prioritized the thrust vector over the attitude actuator, like the, the thrust actuator sum over the uh, attitude actuator sum. So, so you basically reduce the attitude or change the attitude actuator to ensure you get maximum thrust vector command. If your thrust vector is just pointed vertically, you lose a, a control of your attitude. It will just rotate, maintaining that vertical thrust vector until the, that actuator sort of sits at the bottom. Like if you know what I mean, if it's not, um, yeah, or it just tumbles and uh, you know it goes zig 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 on the bottom as uh, as uh, and the 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 rest of the um, that thrust vector is still just not affected pointing vertically um so yeah that that was um that was one of the other things like the absolute nightmare to do the uh to do that thrust prioritization on on six axes but uh, uh it, it would be an interesting an interesting problem to solve great i, I think i don't think we have any questions on the YouTube or the anywhere else. It, it, one thing I just want to mention was, you know, um, uh, they do have those six degrees of feeder, freedom uh, joysticks, right? Where you can actually like pull them up and down. It's like a you know regular joystick with a roll and pitch, and then it's actually got yaw as well. And then you can uh, it's got a vertical. I've, I've only got a four degree of freedom brain though. <laughs> That's the uh, trouble at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> really looking forward to playing this after having played a lot of a game called Descent, which is a six-doff game. So looking forward to playing with uh, one of the six-doff copters with the same control system I used in that game, which is simple keyboard stuff. But... And I'm looking forward to watching you playing with the six-doff copter and <laughs> laughing from the sidelines while I take video. And I'm looking forward to seeing the crash. <laughs> it does need lasers, though, for that game. Right. I don't think LiDAR is, is quite the same. Yep. Hmm. Oh, good. So this is absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk, Pete. Uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, you've got some very complimentary comments there on the uh, from the uh, live stream. And uh, Ian seems particularly uh, keen from uh, Mad Tech to be keen on your vehicle. Oh, so, I mean, uh, we'll have to. Um, he's only down the road. <laughs> we'll have lockdown, we'll have to go and <laughs> yeah, do a live demo. Fly. Yeah, you should definitely do that. <laughs> Put something up on his YouTube channel. Excellent. So, um, so that brings us to the the close of um, this evening's talks.
And uh, so it's been absolutely a, a brilliant day. Um, and we've now got the final day of the conference uh, starting tomorrow morning, Canberra time. And some of you, for Europeans, might decide to you're going to sleep in, and and others of you are going to get up early for um, for your talks. And uh, I think Pete, you might be one of those that needs to get up early, given we've got uh, uh, Tim from Transwing uh, talking at at nine a.m. Canberra time. So my apologies, that was actually a bit of a scheduling stuff up to have you last on the previous evening and and uh, being part of the call tomorrow. So my apologies for your sleep patterns over the next uh, few days. I know, I'm um, power nap. Going back to bed for a few hours now. That's the plan. Yep, excellent. So, uh, so the we, in the morning we've got a series of great talks lined up. We've got uh, Tim Whitehand on the tra from on the Transwing, uh, Bill Geyer giving a helicopter update, um, Leonard uh, giving the uh, infamous or famous S curves. You know the the final twist. The last um, talk, and uh, then Michael with a mission planner update, and um, so and finally we'll have a few short presentations. Now uh, we will have a bit of extra time at the end of the short presentation. So if anyone wants to give a lightning talk, and has you know something has uh, during the previous talks have inspired you to give like a between a two minute and a five minute presentation on something, then feel free to put your hand up and uh, let us know and we'll add you into the schedule. Uh, we had lightning talks to great effect in some past years when we had the face-to-face -face conference, but we didn't really think about them properly for the online. And I think we should, uh, we should think about that. So and add an in if, if somebody has, a, has an idea. So um, wish you all a, a very good night and sleep well and look forward to um, talking to you all in about oh, 11 and a half hours time. Thanks everybody. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Thanks. Good night. See you later all. Good night. Or have a good day.